alive in five, four, three, two, one. Uh, good evening to everybody. I am Professor Kondograb Dilawal, Rizvi, President of Bangladesh Financial Society. I would like to welcome you all to this uh, CME, jointly organized by Bombay's Fine Society mm -hmm. and Bangladesh Fine Society. In this regards, I would like to express my regrets to Professor Devastavan, President of the Bombay's Fine Society, and Visha, uh, Secretary of this Bombay's Fine Society, and uh, our Honorable Islam Secretary of Bangladesh Fine Society for organizing this CMA. During this pandemic time, this CMA is helping us a lot in two ways. We are uh, academically being enriched and also we have a nice way of spending our time. Almost uh, every day in the evening, we are doing some kind of uh, this kind of uh, uh, virtual meetings, either with friends, families, okay with your colleagues. So I, I would like to uh, thank everybody, especially from my colleagues from India, uh, who are very, uh, very eminent uh, spine surgeons and helping Bangladesh Spine Society for quite a long time to develop spine surgeries in Bangladesh. <clears throat> so I will not spend much time. I would rather ask uh, our uh, uh, counterpart, uh, Shivastava. Yeah. To say a few words, uh, and then uh, our uh, moderator uh, uh, is uh, uh, hopefully ready to continue our uh, this first session, first scientific session. We have another session, so we'll have to finish this session on time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Reji, for your kind word. A very good evening to all of you. I welcome all the faculties and delegates from India and Bangladesh to join this combined CME meeting of Bombay Spine Society and Bangladesh Spine Society. This is going to be a very promising and interesting clinical session where the cervical trauma and cervical <coughs> challenges will be covered. And it is going to be really helpful and very useful for all of us. Now, without wasting much time, I will hand over this session to our moderator of this session, Dr. Vishal Peshikyu. Dr. Vishal, you can take over. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, very warm good evening to all of you here and to the <laughs> who are uh, watching this on Auto TV. Uh, we are known to be on time, so we'll start with the person who has put everybody of us on uh, a clock, Dr. Gautam Zaveri. Dr. Gautam Zaveri uh, is one of my mentors. When I started my spine practice, he was the one I looked up to. And uh, he is the authority for fractures of the spine. So without uh, wasting much time, I would request Dr. Gautam to start with his talk, uh, please. Can I be allowed to share my screen, please? Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vishal, for your kind words. And thank you very much to the Bangladesh Spine Society and the Bombay Spine Society for giving me an opportunity to be with here, you here today. I've been to Dhaka before for an AO Spine course as faculty. And I'm aware that spine surgeons in Dhaka are very, very adept and very skilled and routinely manage spinal trauma and spinal infections in a beautiful manner. <clears throat> and therefore, probably a lot of what I'm going to speak is going to be familiar to them, something which they do on a daily basis. I have been asked to speak on traumatic subaxial cervical facet subluxations and dislocations. I will be covering the epidemiology of this very common injury, the mechanism of injury, the spectrum, and the management. Cervical subaxial facet dislocations and subluxations is the most common sur subaxial cervical injury. They are equally interspersed between unilateral and bilateral dislocations. In the younger age, they typically occur secondary to high velocity injuries as found in motor vehicular collisions or pedestrian accidents or motorcycle accidents. The median age of these patients is about 40. Males are much more commonly injured and these patients usually land up with a fairly significant neurologic deficit. 
On the other hand, there is a second group of patients which are elderly in the 70 plus age group. Here, the male-female ratio is similar. These patients have low velocity injuries from domestic falls or fall from a standing height where neurologic deficit is a little less common. The most commonly level injured level is C6, 7, followed by C5, 6, and C4, 5. The most common mechanism of injury for this is a distraction flexion injury. What does that mean? It means that the head of the patient with the neck is in flexion. And then a distraction force is applied because the neck goes into further flexion because of a force which is applied from the back. When the neck is suddenly flexed, what happens is that the injury travels from the back to the front. And therefore, the structures which are injured first are the posterior ligamentous complex, which is torn or dis in distraction. The first injured structure is the ligamentum flavum. This is followed by a rupture of the supraspinous and interspinous ligaments, a disruption of the one or both the capsules. Then if the injury continues further, there is a disruption of the annulus, a disc herniation may or may not occur. There is a tear of the posterior longitudinal ligament. The anterior longitudinal ligament is not usually torn. It gets stripped off the anterior surface of the uh, vertebral bodies. And often there are facet fractures or even superior end plate fractures of the vertebral body. The spectrum of injury as described by Allen of a distraction flexion injury is in four stages. The first stage is when there is an injury which starts from the, from the back. There is either a stretching or a tear of the posterior ligamentous complex, but the injury stops at this level time. If you look, the patient when he is lying down may, and an x-ray is taken cross lat table lateral, you may find there is nothing wrong with the spine because the anterior structures are intact usually. Sometimes there may be a slight subluxation of the facet anteriorly called as perch facets. Occasionally, the second stage of this injury is where along with the flexion distraction, there is a rotational force involved, which causes a dislocation of one facet called as a unifacet dislocation. A purely flexion, this pure distraction flexion injury can result in dislocation of both the facets, which is the third stage of this injury. And finally, if this force continues, the entire ligamentous complex disrupts and the vertebral body translates completely, resulting in a spondyloptosis. The management of this injury, within once the patient has reached the hospital, involves primarily hemodynamic stabilization as an emergency. Along with that goes hand-in-hand -hand clinical and radiological assessment. Once you have adequately diagnosed the injury, you go on to the emergency treatment and then follow it up with a definitive treatment as per your choice. It is vital to establish the airway in these patients, ensure breathing and circulation. As we all know that maintenance of adequate oxygenation and appropriate blood pressure is vital in limiting the secondary spinal cord injury. And therefore, the ABC is extremely important. Also, you must remember that in patients with a severe spinal cord injury, what we see is a Cushing's response where there is a sympathetic breakdown. These patients will come in with hypotension, bradycardia, shallow breathing and tachypnea. In these patients, infusing them with a lot of fluids can lead to fluid overload. In fact, the only way of bringing up their hypotension bradycardia sometimes is ionotropic support. This is followed by clinical assessment of the patient. About 20% of patients with cervical spine injury have associated head injuries. There are associated injuries to the chest, abdomen, pelvis, other skeletal injuries, all together constituting about 40% of the patients. If there is one injury in the spine, you must always remember to look for another spinal fracture, either in the cervical spine or along the length of the spine. The incidence is almost 15%. If there is a fracture, obviously one needs to look for a neurological injury and classify this injury based on your ASIA grading. 
and decide whether the type of injury is incomplete, complete, or a patient is neurologically intact. Having done this basic examination, one then log rolls the patient in order to do a cervical spine examination, look for tenderness, bruising, gaps, palpable, any hematomas, and one also takes the history of any previous pre-existing spinal problems as well as other medical comorbidities. When the radiological evaluation for a number of years has been, has been a little controversial, we follow a very simple protocol. We ask who should be investigated, what investigation should be done, and when should it be done? Who should be investigated? The nexus criteria, which are 99.5% sensitive in detecting a cervical spine injury, suggest that all patients who have symptoms, whether they be neck pain, radicular pain, neurologic deficit, should always be evaluated radiologically. Patients with a blunt cervical trauma or a blunt vehicle, motor vehicular accident, and if the patient is unconscious, again, you need to evaluate this patient. You also need to be careful about evaluating patients who are asymptomatic initially, but if they are under influence of alcohol or they are not alert or oriented, and they have other distracting injuries which may take away the attention from the cervical spine injury. What investigation should you do? You start off with a plain x-rays. We routinely order a three-view trauma series. and But you must remember that distraction flexion stage one and two are often missed on plain x-rays. And therefore, it is vital to look for subtle signs of a flexion injury. And what are these signs? A widening of the interspinous interval, an avulsion fracture of the spinous process, widening of the facet joint, malalignment of facet joints and AP. If you see the facet joints in AP in lateral, at one point in pure lateral, and at other points, you see an oblique projection with double facets, you know there is a rotational element there. If there is an anterior translation of the vertebra, or there is a wedge compression fracture or malaligned spinous processes. The next investigation that is ordered usually is a CT scan. I usually order one single shoulder pull down cross table lateral view. If in that view I do not see an adequate C67, C71 junction, I do not waste time. I would rather have a CT scan to show me what is going on. So inadequate lateral x-rays. If your plain x-rays have shown an abnormality, which you need to study more to understand the morphology of the injury, you could do a CT scan. All unconscious patients, patients who have few segments, deformed spines like in ankylosing spondylitis, or a patient on ventilator, we order a CT scan. And this is what we look at. What we see are facet fractures in about 25% of unifacetal and 63% of bifacetal dislocations. And what is classically described as a reverse hamburger sign because of dislocation of the facet. It's also called as a naked facet sign. The CT scan is extremely sensitive in identifying posterior element fractures and even relatively very good in diagnosing discoligamentous injury. If the patient is neurologically impaired, you must do an MRI scan. Children, patients with head injury, neurologically intact patients before you do a close reduction or a posterior reduction, open reduction. Doubt in the diagnosis of PLC injury, all these patients one would like to do an MRI scan. The MRI is highly sensitive in detecting PLC injuries. Stir weighted images are better. Disc disruptions and herniations can be diagnosed. And finally, one can look at the status of the spinal cord. Dynamic x-rays are very rarely done in acute setting. In my practice, for patients who are neurologically injured, we never do dynamic x-rays. If there is a doubtful PLC disruption at the end of x-ray, CT and MRI, which is very, very rare today, then one can think about doing a dynamic x-ray in awake patients. This is an active test where the patient himself flexes his and extends his neck. The problem with dynamic x-rays is they are limited by pain, spasm, and often the quality of the x-ray is very poor, so making it difficult to diagnose. 
On dynamic X-rays, one is looking for anterior translation and increase in local kyphosis, increase in the interspinous interval or facet widening or subluxation. The final controversy is, should you do this radiological evaluation, that is the MRI and CT before or after close reduction? The people who from favor close reduction before MRI say, that the single most important intervention in a neurologically injured patient is to reduce the dislocation because that will promote neurology and relieve pain. However, there are others who say that when you reduce the dislocation, there is a chance that a disc herniation may occur and this may cause worsening in neurology. In our hospital, we follow the following protocol. An MRI is recommended before reduction if patients are present without deficit or with a partial deficit in unconscious patients and if the patients present more than eight hours after injury. That brings us to our next thing that once we have diagnosed our injury, we need to start planning the emergency treatment. In the past years, a lot of emphasis has been placed on high dose methyl prednisolone. However, there is, this has become a controversial directive. And today the guidelines are controversial and tossed front and back. Fellings conducted a large systematic review and as well as a uh, multi-center trial and concluded that a 24-hour infusion in patients presenting within eight hours of acute spinal cord injury should be tried unless there are other contraindications. This, as I mentioned earlier, the single most important intervention is the reduction of the facet dislocation as early as possible. The methods are traction, which can be gradual or rapid, manipulation under anesthesia or open reduction. I prefer normally to do a rapid close reduction. It is done in the emergency smod or in the ICU with an IITV or X-ray machine which stays with the patient. Under local anesthesia, we apply skull tongs. The patient is awake and alert, responding to our dynamically to our changes. The patient's neck is first kept in a slight amount of flexion in order to unlock the facets. And gradually, traction is increased every 10 minutes. Every time the traction is increased, Immediately, neurological examination is done and an X-ray is done to check whether distraction is being achieved. Once adequate distraction of the facet joints is in, done, then the neck can be, under with traction applied, can be extended and the reduction is again confirmed with an X-ray. Once the reduction is confirmed, the traction weight is reduced to prevent over distraction. When should you stop your close reduction? You stop your close reduction once reduction is achieved. Usually it takes about 20 to 25 kgs of weight. You stop if there is any neurological deterioration. You stop if there is over distraction of the facet joints. Or if you have given reduction a trial for about two, two to three hours and you don't see any hope of any further reduction. The advantages of this rapid close reduction technique that we do is that it is relatively safe, allows decompression of the neural structures fairly rapidly and is effective in almost 90% of patients. The problem is there is of course a risk if you are not careful of over distraction and neurologic deficit, traction and pin side problems and it is more time consuming than doing a manipulation under anesthesia. If in our patients we find that reduction is not being achieved, the facets are locked, we put them under anesthesia and under anesthesia with muscle relaxation, with gentle traction, the distraction is achieved and then we reduce the dislocation and if it is possible to reduce it easily, then we can go ahead immediately and do a surgical stabilization at the same setting. When do we do an emergency open reduction? For patients who have had an adequate trial of conservative close reduction, but the dislocation continues to be locked. If there is an associated disc herniation with the dislocation, if there are associated facet fractures, because the chances of reduction are far lesser in these patients, 
in more caudal dislocations where larger amount of weight is required it takes a longer time and often these patients the lateral x-ray is not very clear and then it becomes difficult to judge whether you have done an adequate reduction or not finally some institutions we don't do this maneuver do early decompression this is typically in recommended in centers where there is pre hospital medical care where the paramedics inform the hospital that they are coming with such and such patients the hospital keep their or ready within a matter of an hour or if the patient coming in the patient is wheeled into the or if you have such facilities it is worthwhile doing emergency open reduction the open reduction can be either anterior there are various techniques described as you i have shown over here the advantage of emergency open reduction it is the fastest method of reduction if you go anteriorly discectomy can be done prior to the reduction mri is unnecessary because you are removing the compression of the spinal cord before doing the, the uh, reduction and stabilization can be performed at the same sitting the problem is because you are not doing a direct reduction under vision there is a higher risk of failure especially if there are facet fractures here is one such example where unifacetal dislocation we have done a close reduction or open reduction anterior along with a primary fixation the other alternative is to do a posterior reduction the advantage of posterior reduction is you are seeing the dislocated facet under vision and once you are seeing this facet if you cannot easily manipulate the reduction then you can actually excise that facet drill it off or use a kerosene punch and excise the facet and then reduce the dislocation too excessive manipulation can cause a neurological injury here is a patient who had come to me with a young patient quadriplegia with a distal cervical injury and i felt that i did not want to waste time going through the process of reduction and went in and did an emergency open reduction and internal fixation unfortunately the patient did not recover neurologically the controversy is should you do a rapid close reduction or an emergency open reduction well we all know realignment of the spine is the fastest method of decompressing the spinal cord there is a risk of disc herniation during close reduction and therefore there may be neurological worsening even rapid close reduction takes up to 3 hours irreducible dislocations are not uncommon and the rapid reduction fails in about 10 to 12% of patients that is why an emergency anterior open reduction is sometimes beneficial i follow the following protocol i always go through a rapid close reduction in safe if if it is safe in awake patients emergency anterior over open reduction is preferred when patients present immediately after injury with a deficit and in patients with high risk of irreducible coming to the last part and that is the definitive treatment the non operative treatment is preferable in distraction stage 1 or sometimes in unifacetal distraction injuries after a close reduction has been achieved if you decide to treat them non operatively they are adequately immobilized in a four post collar or a halo vest for about 12 weeks following which flexion extension lateral radiographs are taken if it is stable then you can leave them alone if there is persistent abnormal movement patient may require a secondary stabilization if you are for definitive treatment of stage 2 3 and 4 injuries one can choose either one of the following approaches literature shows us multiple multicentric combined randomized trials have shown that the outcomes for unifacetal bifacetal dislocation treated with either anterior or posterior approach is essentially the same in terms of neurology in terms of complications in terms of long term results so when does one select each approach if it is an irreducible dislocation without any disc prolapse then a posterior approach is preferred if there is a posterior impingement from lamina or facets which requires decompression if there are associated facet fractures i prefer to go posteriorly ankylosing spondylitis where the bone quality is poor and you require long segment fixation one prefers to do a posterior approach and in patients who have osteoporosis where anterior fixation may not be good enough 
advantages as i said it allows direct re reduction of the dislocation posterior stabilization is a tension band fixation it is far more rigid it allows wide decompression and excellent correction of kyphosis and fixation can be easily extended gautam sorry we are running out of time okay we'll stop you there so a very so important so point so can you uh, uh, yeah pro Disadvantages: prone position may result in loss of reduction, resulting in consequently in a neurologic deficit. The other problems we all know. Anterior approach is required in patients who have spinal cord compression from retropulse vertebral body or disc, in whom we are planning an open reduction in an emergency without an MRI, and for definitive treatment of any distraction flexion injury. So here are the advantages. We all know that. the only important thing you have to remember is that anterior cervical plate is a buttress plate it is unable to resist shear loads and therefore chances of failure are higher and these patients once you put put them an anterior plate need to be protected in some kind of a semi rigid device for at least 8 to 12 weeks so the timing of surgery we all know the quality of data is poor but recent systematic reviews show that early surgery is much better in terms of improved neurological recovery allows a mobilization and improved nursing care a word of caution 20% of flexion injuries are associated with vertebral artery injury so you need to be aware of this and make an effort to diagnose to conclude distraction flexion injuries are the most common associated with leave associated with neurological deficit distraction 1 and 2 are often missed and therefore you must look out for these injuries in patients with blunt cervical trauma ct mrs are done they help to further diagnose the injury rapid spinal realignment is the single most important intervention that may facilitate neurological recovery and the results of anterior posterior combined surgery in terms of neurological recovery are essentially the same decision is based on the individual patient fractures and surgeon comfort as i have just mentioned a brief flow chart to show you what how i manage a distraction flexion injury if there is no disc prolapse we go through a rapid close reduction if it is successful do an anterior surgery if it's unsuccessful you move to the other side if there is a disc prolapse you would do an anterior open reduction if it reduces anterior fusion is done at the same sitting if it is irreducible you have two options if it's a unifacet dislocation you can think about doing an intrathyroid fusion or else you can do anterior discectomy plus posterior instrumentation so distraction flexion injury one was missed initially by some people one week later so we had to go in and do a posterior stabilization close reduction and anterior fixation patient with a disc herniation anterior corpectomy anterior fusion at the same time in an emergency unifacetal locked facets anterior plus posterior surgery and patient who presented with a delayed problem unifacetal dislocation with severe radiculopathy and reflex sympathetic dystrophy done anterior discectomy followed by posterior knocking off the facet and reduction and then an anterior fusion thank you very much for your patience and i hope that you all have gained from this lecture thank you thank you gautam for an excellent talk as usual uh, we are uh, running a bit over time i would request dr fazul haq to start with his uh, talk we have 15 minutes for this talk sir so if you can share your screen and start with your talk sir he is going to talk on the surgical strategy for subaxial cervical spine injury hello can you hear me Hello. Yes, sir. We can hear you clearly. Okay. So, um, uh, thank you. Uh, very uh, good evening to distinguished faculties and delegates. Uh, thank you, uh, Gautam Javeri. Uh, actually, uh, covered most of my some areas of uh, cervical, sub cervical, uh, sub cervical spinal cord injury, a uh, surgical strategy as well. so i am going to uh, discuss this uh, surgical strategy of sur subaxial cervical spinal cord injury it's a it's a it's a controversy sorry i i can't move actually 
you will have to go to the presentation mode uh, slide show yeah okay okay, okay. that's fine slide show please oh yeah get yeah, yeah. so, okay. um, there are there are a lot of controversy regarding the uh, surgical management of cervical cervical spinal cord injury you see a scenario it's a, a compressed fracture a c6 with a uh, widening of uh, facet oh. as as well as uh, um, there is a um, ligamentous uh, posterior longitudinal uh, posterior ligament complex uh, edema here so uh, this is these are the scenario should i do say neurological intact cases uh, Okay. Sorry, some noise is coming. Uh, so this is one of the scenario. This it it comes to the point: should I operate this case or not? Another uh, scenario: you see the complete C six C five complete neurological deficit with uh, this, with translation. So what surgical approach should I select? So with this. Uh, I can start with uh, two third of the cervical spine injury um, occurs in the subaxial cervical region. Dislocation occurs almost commonly in the C5, C6 level. We need a consistent algorithm for for the for the treatment is is really really an important issue. Uh, sparsity of university universally accepted classification system and the optimal treatment strategy is is still under debate so uh, gautam javeri and his colleague uh, published this paper in uh, indian orthopedic journal in 2017 they mentioned very clearly uh, there are three important points over here the management of these injuries is based upon recognition of fracture pattern and assessment of degree of instability and the presence or absence of neurological deficit so with this um, uh, identification of fracture morphology and all these things we need the good classification you see the classification from 1949 till now 2006 uh, 16 is a lot of classification but no one system however has demonstrated a superiority or broader acceptance but this uh, this classification this silix and ao spine classification is most of the people adopt this uh, two classification very commonly um in 2007 spine trauma study group uh, developed a subaxial cervical spinal injury classification called silix that silix scoring guide the whether we need the surgery or not and there are three main categories of their uh, um, injury classification system the injury morphology integrity of the disco ligamental complex and the neurological status uh, there is a scoring system and this they adopt this scoring system i think everybody knows this this three and less is a conservative and above this is a operative the four is a controversial issue this uh, silix classification and the silix method following mostly uh, uh in in my training period i also used this uh, using this uh, silix classification and um, most of the people are also using and world federation of neurosurgical societies recommend this classification and ao classification i think this uh, ao spine knowledge forum in 2013 described a classification consists of three uh, areas the morphology of injury neurological status and um, the other clinical modification um, clinical comorbidities so the morphology it consists of i think the a is the compression type of fracture all the compression and b is the 
uh, disruption of either anterior or posterior tension band is a tension band injury. And the C is disruption of both the anterior and posterior tension band. And there is a translatory instability. Other than this, for the relevant parameter is the facet joint injury, neurological injury, and comorbidities. Although the AO spine supplemented classification is very promising, though it is very, uh, it is not very user friendly and it is a bit complicated. Um, the German spine section of German Society of Orthopedics and Traumatology. There is a 19, is a highly um, expert centers for spinal injury. Uh, the German society uh, have a study and they recommended the AO spine classification. And they recommended like that a AO and A1, A2 injuries are treated conservatively, but have to be monitored for progressive kyphosis. A3 are operated majority of the cases, A4, A2, and A4, B, and C injuries are treated surgically. Most of the injuries can be treated under plate stabilization and interbody support. But A4 fracture needed vertebral body replacement sometimes. There is a risk like this, in this case, you see the 19 years old woman C7 bust fracture, as you see, no neurological deficit and no DLC injury. The, uh, the silic score is two and the AOI spine classification is the A3. A3 is the, is the bust fracture upper in vertebra is involved and posterior wall is also involved. In this type of cases, if we do the conservative, the silix classification repair mentioned that non-operative treatment. If we do a non-operative treatment, then we have to follow it up very carefully. The risk of progression of angular kyphosis and deteriorate the sagittal profile. So we have to measure the monosegmental end plate angle. If it is more than 15, then we have to flow critically and do the surgery to prevent the sagittal profile, to maintain the sagittal profile. And um, for the diagnosis, the computed trauma, uh, I think Dr. My, Dr. Gautam Javeri is clearly mentioned all these things very clearly. I'm just highlighting few area. Computed tomography is very favored modality. Conventional X-ray is reserved for the lacking of dangerous Mechan mechanical injury cases. MRI is recommended in cases of unexplained neurological deficit and to exclude the discoligamentous injury. Um, CT angiogram is recommended in high grade of facet injuries or in presence of uh, suspected vertebral artery injury. Basic principle of management. Actually, what is the therapeutic goal? The therapeutic goal is the, to maintain a permanently stable subcervical spine, subaxial spine, free of uh, pain-free cervical spine and avoidance of neurological damage, improvement of already, already existing neurological deficit. So as you see the AO spine classification the surgical strategy, what I can say from AO, A1, and A2 is the conservative management. A3 is majority situation needs surgery. A4, B, and C injuries all are need surgery. But there is also some facet injury also. The facet injury, uh, a, a, F3 and F4 is surgical with other component of injury, but F3 and N2, the facet injury more than 40% as well as nerve root involvement, that radicular pain or N2, then we need maybe, it's most often we need surgery. 
posterior approach. So um, these are the scenario. In surgical strategy, first I have to identify the cases, which cases needs the surgery. We can identify with this classification. I think this is a little bit complex, but we can very clearly, not only the injury morphology, neurological as well as the facet joint is a major part of the uh, playing the important role to the maintain the stability of the cervical spine. So the facet injury should be included in the in the in the classification. The timing of surgery. The timing of surgery. You see the very very latest article uh, in Spinal Cord Journal 2020. The time is spine. I mean, this early decompression has a sound pathophysiologic, uh, rationally and clinical evidence of efficacy and international guideline recommend, recommendations as a treatment option of, that is an early decompression. And another, another study is if you see the time of decompression in general, the existing evidence supported improved neurological recovery amongst our cervical spinal cord injury patient undergoing surgery 24 hours post injury. So the early surgery is really, really benefited. Uh, reduction of locked facet. Uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Gautam Jabari is mentioned very details clearly. The facet dislocation is a really emergency. First tried with the skull traction in my experience as I worked in a uh, spinal injury rehabilitation center, I, I did a lot of cases with this tongue traction gradually. And uh, my experience, I, I believe that is one of the good method also. If not reduce that external maneuver, but if external maneuver fails, this anterior open reduction, if irreducible, the posterior facetectomy, the anterior fusion is mandatory after the reduction. Um, there is a, a question whether we should do the MRI pre-reduction um, pre MRI. This is a big issue. Um, what you see, the latest literature says that um, Vicaro et al. have indicated that close reduction in the AOI and alert patient may be safe Without, without having a pre-reduction MRI. Some other studies have also indicated that close reduction is sedated patient may be safe in most cases. Um, in, in the, in a, in a, this is one of the study in Asian Spinal, uh, Asian Spine Journal is a third word perspectives. They mentioned also the MRI of the spine in AOAC patient within four hours. I mean, this is an early, early hours. It does not change the management of the patient. However, we can have, we can say that the SAS patient can proceed to traction without waiting for the MRI. So um, this is a debated issue, but what I can say I think uh, I think it's a very rare cases needs any uh, damage, but uh, better to do proceed for the uh, early cases proceed for the reduction. The reduction anterior approach is safer. Anterior fusion is mandatory after reduction, and the technique uh, um, previous speaker mentioned very clearly. Anterior bone grafting is the best way to achieve good fusion. The surgical approaches. The surgical approaches is de it depends upon the morphology of the injury. The in the review literature, the consensus, consensus of experts and the patient preference, bust and compression injuries, bust or compression injuries and distraction injuries are more likely to be treated with a single anterior approach. Translation or rotator rotation injuries are more likely be approached posteriorly with or with combined anterior or posterior surgery. The treatment in uh, treatment of uh, uh, treatment of injuries of sub sub cervical uh, sub cervical 
spine is a recommendation from the German society. The most injuries can be treated with interplate and stabilization uh, and interbody support. But a four fracture may need the vertebral replacement. In certain cases, additive or pure postural instrumentation is needed. Usually is the lateral mass screw is surface. The enter alone cervical treatment, uh, cervical, uh, enter alone surgical treatment for sub subaxial cervical spine facet dislocation is a review. It's a very latest article 2021. They mentioned that this systemic review supports efficacy and success of enter reduction, fusion, and instrumentation for the cervical facet fracture dislocation. It is safe. Uh, safe from a neurological standpoint, revision, re revision rate is due to concurrent facet fracture is very low. So finally, the take home message is AOA spine classification for subaxial cervical injuries is recommended. A AO, A1 and A2 injuries are treated conservatively, but have no, have to be monitored for progressive kyphosis. A3 injuries are operated in the majority of cases. A4, B and C type of injuries are treated surgically. Most injuries can be treated with anterior plate stabilization and interbody support. In certain cases, posterior instrumentation is needed. Usually the lateral mass screw is sufficient. Thank you. Thank you for patience hearing. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, sir, for that brilliant talk. Uh, we are running short on time and we're already behind by more than 12 minutes. Our next uh, uh, talk is actually a case presentation of one of the most common injury, a unifacetal uh, dislocation, usually 5, 6, 6, 7 level. Uh, Dr. Vishal Kundanani, the young star of Bombay Spine Society, the secretary of Bombay Spine Society, and uh, a leading figure for uh, spinal injuries will be speaking on uh, the first case, Vishal, unfortunately, we can't allow the given uh, time for this because we have to accommodate two cases. So if we can have a quick presentation, then we'll have our panelists of today, Professor Mohammad Shah Alam, Professor uh, Razul Karim, and uh, Dr. Samir Dalvi and Ram Chadda, sir, uh, taking questions and discussing this case. Vishal? Sure, sure, sure. <clears throat> uh, thanks, Vishal, for a humble introduction. I think uh, for the sake of time, I'll just bring about the case and the dilemmas involved and how was it managed. And I'm sure the panelists will do the justice of bringing out the discussion in this case. So this is a 21 year old young guy who had a fall of heavyweight four weeks ago. And uh, he had only neck pain with mild weakness of arm. And like Dr. Gautam very rightly mentioned, initial x-rays turned out to be normal or they were supposedly termed to be normal. And it was uh, only at four weeks when the patient came to us, we found that he had left C5 myotomal weakness, which was two on five. And all the other signs of upper motor neuron lesion or cord signs are <laughs> So this was like a monoplesia with a cervical spine injury. And these were the x-rays at four weeks. And it showed uh, a grade two listhesis with a unifacetal or a facetal subluxation. And this is the time at four weeks when the patient came to us. And these are the x-rays of the patient. So the big question arises whether classifications really are helpful in planning management for these patients. Uh, I think there are all these set of classifications that are available and the, the downside is that though on one hand they bring uniformity in describing these fractures, but unfortunately the guidelines on the type of surgery required to manage these patients or versus non-surgical management is yet to be coming up in objective manner from any of these classification systems. So this is something that we all must remember. Six classification is something that is available. Of course, it also gives guidelines, but in this patient, of course, where there is a borderline gray zone, again, specific guidelines on how to manage these patients is yet lacking in there. Now the question is such patients, whether we should do a closed awake reduction or should we put them in ward with traction? Or okay, Vishal, I would want to stop you here for a minute. I would like to ask uh, Professor Ram Chadda to come over here. At this stage, this is a very common presentation we have. Most of the spine surgeons have seen this uh, every few years, patients coming to us at this stage. What is the investigation of choice at this stage for you, sir? As of today, he is four weeks post-injury and he does not have any major neurology. 
Vishal, does he have any radicular symptoms? He has mild pain, but he's mostly come for C5 deltoid weakness. He has come for a C C5 deltoid weakness. Okay, so in this case, I would counsel him saying that he's 21 years old. He has an unstable injury in the spine and I would need more information for which in the presence of the deltoid weakness, I would ask for an MRI and also tell him I may need a CT scan later if I'm planning surgery. Any role of closed awake traction or reduction in these patients, sir? Not till I do my MRI and or my CT. So I think this is something that was debatable till only a couple of years ago when there were articles to suggest that uh, this one controversy, when to do MRI, when to do CT scan. There were papers suggesting that awake close reduction should be attempted even in emergency room. But unfortunately, it has gone in disvogue. And now it is a consensus that please do not do any kind of manipulation in any of these patients, even when there is no neurology or even in patients with complete neurology for the sake, because you would want to evaluate the disco ligamentous complex. And of course, these patients may sometimes have hidden OPLL resulting into worsening of neurology. And so medical legally also, you should not attempt awake reduction in any of these patients unless until you have evaluated them in great detail by doing a CT scan also and an MRI also. So these are the CT scan and MRIs, Vishal and Dr. Ram. Uh, should I proceed or you would want to? Uh, so at this stage, I would like to get Professor Mohamed Shah Alam on board. Sir, this is the CT scan done. This is a patient who has come to your OPD. How would you want to proceed from here? It is first facet on one side and locked on other side with no fracture of the facet. Uh, do we have Professor Mohamed Shah Alam with us? Probably he is not with us. So, uh, can uh, Professor Rizul Karim please uh, take over on his behalf and uh, tell us what is, the, this is a very common presentation, sir, uh, in our practice. So, if you are uh, having this CT scan at your disposal, would you at this stage go ahead for an MRI or would you be happy just to treat on this CT scan? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vishal, for your uh, nice case presentation. Uh, I think the patient needs before surgery or before going to planning for surgery, patient need MRI. Yeah, MRI because uh, we want to see the uh, how much this is uh, uh, prolapsed and compress the cord. For this why this patient need to do MRI for uh, before the surgery, surgical management. So it's, uh, it's a very important message. MRI is done not only to evaluate if there is any OPLL. It is not only meant to evaluate the posterior ligamentous complex, but also to assess the status of the disc, like in this particular patient and in all patients, wherever there is facet dislocation, it is extremely important to see if the disc complex is disrupted because this disc, if it is disrupted, any attempt to reduce it back will only pull back the disc fragment resulting into worsening of neurology. And this should be kept in mind. And assessment of disco ligamentous OPLL is very, very important. So, like it has uh, evaluated. Yes, at this stage, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Samir Dalvi. Uh, Samir, uh, is Samir here? Yeah, hi. Yes, Samir, we grew up in a, where we would put a Cushfield tong and reduce this in the ANE or in the uh, corridor of the OT and do serial x rays. So, at this stage, once you have seen this, what are the things you would worry about and how would you plan out your treatment here? So now, uh, to me, this is a case who is going in for surgery for sure. So I, 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 I do want to do surgery for this patient. Uh, I already have the information with the uh, X-rays and the MRIs and. Uh, the, uh, sorry, uh, let me rephrase this question. What would you do differently if this patient came to you on the first day, and what would you do differently now that he has come after four weeks? Can you please? I'm sorry for being. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So I think I understand. I understand your question. Practically, there is no difference because four weeks is still very early. He is not a delayed presentation. He is still a, he is still a fresh presentation. Uh, of course, if he came to me immediately, I would also have to do the trauma protocol and the other things. But now this patient has come walking. So my entire focus is going to be on his cervical spine. Having had these investigations, I will plan a surgery for this patient for sure. But pre-op, I will still put him on tongs and give him a bit of gentle awake traction because an awake... I can monitor his neurology and I can monitor his vital signs to see that he's not getting any bradycardia or anything of that sort. And in case, without huge attempts, with less weights, if it gets reduced, well and good. If it doesn't get reduced, no problem. I'm anyway planning surgery for this patient. 
So uh, my I next question to the panelist is: If uh, you are going to go the, uh, for surgery, there's a lot of talk about <laughs> reduction under general anesthesia with neuromonitoring. A lot of us use neuromonitoring when we're doing traumatic spine, uh, uh, especially in a neurologically intact or a major, majorly intact patient. So would you prefer to do your reduction under GA, under neuromonitoring, if the facility is available to you, or would you do it on... Uh, definitely, on definitely not. NOT not. Because I think if we are going to do a reduction and this patient gets a deficit, right? By the time, see, firstly, neuromonitoring is not real time. Even if you do MEPs, you are going to get your MEP after five or seven minutes. Okay. Then you can't sit and expose the patient and start taking out the disc. This patient is a patient for surgery. He needs anterior fusion for sure. Right. So I will put a bit of weight under, uh, you know, without anesthesia. If it reduces well and good, if not, I don't do any manipulation under general anesthesia. I will first expose anteriorly. I will take out the disc completely and then I will try to reduce maybe with external manipulation but not till the disc is out and the patient is under a controlled circumstance. That is for sure. That's a very important thing. Uh, 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 Professor Ramchanda wants to come in. Sir. Vishal, I have a very simple way of looking at it. Sir. Suppose this patient has come to Samir or to me on Friday evening now. Okay. We will tell him that you, you need an operation for your cervical spine on Monday morning. Are you understanding? Yeah. We now we'll put him on gentle traction. By Monday morning, we'll have a final answer whether we are doing back and front or only front. Okay, that brings us to the next question. Vishal, I'm sorry, I'm going to take this uh, oh, yes, a little yes. bit uh, over there. So it's open to all the uh, panel here. A lot of times, a unifacetal dislocation is extremely difficult to reduce. I mean, uh, if you're a given GA, you've released the disc, you've uh, distracted the body with pins and traction and everything. What is your uh, take here? Would you at this time do an ACDF, get the patient out, check him whether he has any deficit or at the same anesthesia, flip him over and release him from behind? So if I'm not able to get my reduction after doing the anterior discectomy, I will uh, turn the patient back, release the facets, put in posterior implant like lateral mass in my, uh, uh, you know, uh, my skills are uh, limited to lateral mass. So I will do lateral mass and then turn the patient and do a bone graft and plate from the front. So, so I will do a back front back, but it is very, I will not take this patient with a disc like that for a posterior reduction. It is risky. Not that you won't get away with it, but it is risky. So I so will still you accept start a unifacetal dislocation and just do an ACDF with a decompression and come back. Not, That's not, in, not in a 21 year old at four weeks. Okay. Uh, Dr. Fabian wanted to make a point, sir. Uh, uh, may I, may I add a yes, small yes, point, right. please? Uh, this young, young man and is a uh, four weeks of dislocation, the facet dislocation. Um, I'm, I'm, my experience, I, I feel very worried to go in this after one, after four weeks of this facet dislocation, enter approach. Better, better to go posteriorly because the young person with the four weeks, there is a chances of uh, dislocation from the internal is would be difficult. Uh, I believe that better to approach from the posteriorly pass. So about and a third of these facets are, uh, these discs are known to pop out the moment you do a reduction of that unifacetal disc. And if that disc pops out, then you have a big deficit in your hand. So wouldn't you be more comfortable taking the disc out on the front if you're not getting the reduction, then go from behind, reduce it, and then come back in the front and fix it rather than just doing a posterior first approach? The, because the, the four weeks is the time. Because with these four weeks in this facet is this position. What I have seen sometimes there is a there is a started the callus formation is very difficult to to reduce these uh, cases even. Okay, so, uh, so Vishal, uh, I'll I'll just uh, bring out the dilemmas here that usually are mentioned in literature. Yeah. So the, so there are two type of disc evaluation that one must absolutely ensure before even proceeding whether the disc remains intact or it is disrupted. If there is any amount of retrovertebral disc component, you are 100% sure that there is a disc disruption and any attempt at close reduction will only push this material back in the canal, resulting into worsening neuro deficit, whether you do it in NMEPs, whether you do it in neuromonitoring, whether you do it from back or front. If you reduce it, your chances of getting this disc back in the canal by sheer force is very high. And that is why evaluation of this disc disruption is very, very important. And now coming to the options of surgery, 
doing it anteriorly has its own challenges because anteriorly it will require a lot of distraction to get the facet which is locked back into its place invariably forcing surgeons to either use forced distraction causing further neurological worsening or end up doing in situ fusion or end up doing corpectomies which are all probably suboptimal because the ideal situation would be to go reduce it and fix it and reductions anteriorly are easier said than done and that is why all these options are there and these dilemmas what we just heard about that there is going to be absolutely slight agreement on what approach first versus what approach in a combined manner and there is increased likelihood that all surgeons would agree that reduction is mandatory and it can be achieved either by anterior way or posterior almost all papers have mentioned about the variations in surgical treatment and these challenges have been highlighted here so so uh, can you tell us what you did for the case for the sake of time because we are running way way behind time we are 15 minutes behind our schedule can you sure. uh, tell us what you did for this case this last slide coming up uh, anterior approach like i just mentioned may have their own challenges of reduction because of cord distraction that may ensue during anterior reduction maneuvers and posterior approach has its own risk of getting the disc migration in canal if not done gently and sometimes may require a second surgery uh so which way to combine the approaches has again been a matter of uh, uh, controversy there are uh, challenges there however there are also some flow charts mentioned in there though simply seen but also complex so what we did in this case was we put the patient on traction and uh, we did a posterior job first we did a facet resection did what dr samid alvi rightly mentioned we did a posterior facet resection got a subtle reduction there under traction intraoperatively under neuro monitoring got our lateral masses in there turned the patient and did a anterior bone grafting along with a cage fixation there so this was what was done in this patient however very similar second case scenario i'm just finishing in one minute in one second this is another case scenario where there was facet dislocation however if you see there was a chip fracture of the facet and just by getting traction it got completely reduced not requiring any posterior maneuver for reduction but an anterior acdf was sufficing in this particular case scenario so the message is that reduction is important and can sometimes be achieved only by traction preoperatively any kind of maneuver done preoperatively can be really a disastrous situation resulting into worsening of neurological deficit reductions can easily be achieved from posterior however disco ligamentous complex evaluation is a key to planning your surgical management in these kind of fractures there thank you vishal over thank to you thank you vishal thank you vishal for uh, an excellent presentation as usual i would like now to uh, invite i would invite dr kairun nabi khan to present his case now do we have that presentation with uh, up so while we go ahead vishal i think dr sudhi shrivasta who is the president bombay spine society has immense experience on neglected fracture dislocation maybe we can have his a small word yeah, so for him the talk is coming up uh, dr uh, shrivasta sir you yeah. can uh, 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 yes yes get the so, some work from this so even if you go by literature or say the heavy traction has been tried but the patient should be awake as rightly mentioned by samit so that you can neurologically examine the patient unifacetal dislocation reduction has a specific maneuver and we should know that so if there is a unifacetal dislocation on one side you have to rotate the cervical spine in that way and most of the time you get the reduction most of the time so that maneuver one has to do even when surgically you are you are exposing anteriorly you have taken out the disc there are very high chance of getting reduction if you just to do that maneuver so this i wanted to add thank you sir thank you so much uh, so uh, dr karun nabi khan sir can you share your screen sir uh, uh, dr bishal yes sir Uh, yeah. Uh, before Khairul uh, Sir coming up, I would like to ask a question to Dr. Sivastu Sir. That yeah. uh, how long you can wait uh, for uh, trying for a uh, maneuver to reduce unifacetal dislocation? No, it is exactly the uh, thing which uh, actually uh, Dr. Ram Chadda mentioned. Suppose patient has come in the emergency, you try reducing it. and you are watching the neurology of the patient if you are not able to get it even after increasing the weight of the traction in that case i have gone till 12 kg also it also depends upon the level of the vertebra so usually if you have a level 4 you add 2 and multiply by 2 one add and multiply by 2 so that much weight in pond can be added 
and I have actually put the weight almost 12 to 15 kg in a patient and I have got the reduction. But neurological examination is extremely important, periodic neurological examination. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, can we start with the presentation of your case? Uh, we are not getting the audio from your side, sir. Hello, please start speaking. Hello, Dr. Karun Nabi, please yes, sir. unmute yourself. You are yourself. not hearing, sir. I, I, I am unmuted. Okay. Can you hear me now? But, no, no. Sir, your audio is very low volume, sir. Yes, yes. We yes. can't hear what you are saying, sir. You can increase oh. the volume. Dr. Kharunobi, your audio oh. is very low Are volume. You, sir, we cannot hear. Hey. Can we hear now? No, please. Raise your volume. Please go to slideshow. Yes, I have gone to slideshow. Please go to slideshow. Yes. Can you okay. Me? Okay. Yeah, yes. Yeah. It's okay. Thank you for the disruption. Uh, please louder, please. The previous uh, speakers have spoken on cervical spine injury. I will share a. Uh, I will share the design of the spine case. That's a, a 25 year old male worker with me with the history of neck pain. Left bacteria for one month. It was so severe for last five days that it hampers his daily life, including food. So you need to increase your volume. We can barely hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Can you hear me now? Better. Still low. Please continue. My. Hello. Can you hear me? No, no, no. Please, please increase your volume. <coughs> sir, I would suggest that you remove your headphones and microphone. Use the computer microphone. Disconnect your headphone and disconnect it completely. Use the computer microphone. Can you hear me now? No, no, not, no, no, not yet. Okay. So, uh, is your headphone uh, still connected to your computer? So, why no, are we no, getting I, this? I have removed the headphone. Yes, it is better. Headphone. It is better. It is better. You okay. disconnect okay. your. Okay. Yes. Sorry for the disruption. Yeah, come closer to the computer. Come closer to the computer. Okay, okay. Uh, pain was so severe for the last five days, it hampered his daily life, including sleep, and it could not be relieved by any means. He also had tingling, numbness, and weakness of left upper limb. Here, he, the patient came to me. You can see the, another person is lifting his left hand. It cannot be put down due to severe pain. It was a but video is not playing. I'm sharp. Laterally, it's prolapsed at C6, C7 level. And what are the surgery? The decision was surgery because with so much excruciating pain, he paid for and he's suffering from last one month and he's having neurological deficit like 
uh, we wanted a surgical on option. The what are the surgical option? There are only anterior cervical discectomy, SCDF with case plus plating for most motion preservation. There is option of artificial disc, posterior cervical laminectomy, and anterior cervical microforamenotomy. Nothing can happen. Then all is well. Yeah, and one day at a time. Uh, Dr. Abhay, can you mute your uh, uh, volume uh, speaker, please? Correct. First symptoms, if symptoms test, if test negative, back to square one. If symptoms, symptoms test, test, test positive, then the, uh, Dr. Abhay, the host, the yeah. host can mute him. Can you hear me? The host can mute him. The host can mute him. The host, please mute rest of the participants. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. One day at a time. Level so. disease and anterior and the dysfunction my choice of surgery is anterior cervical microforamen to me. It was described by HD Ju in 1996. Since then, various modification of the technique is being used. Indications and routes of surgery as men shown in the figure. You can see the indication is laterally prolapsed cervical disc without signs of myelopathy. And there are options for posterior surgery and anterior surgery. And skin incision, usual position like ACDF and a small, smaller transverse incision is made on the side affected. Surgical yeah. pulse, a five to six millimeter bold ringing is done on the lower part of the vertebra above and the medial to the foramen transversarium. Drilling is continuous till PLL is reached Bony bleeding is dealt with bone wax. Disc is removed with a nerve book and micro rongers. Osteophytes and ligament is dealt with fine curate, upcut and drill. There is a surgical video. And the drilling is, I'm drilling and on the left side mentioned and Upcut is the and this ronger is used to remove soft tissues. Drilling is still continued at the until the last part uh, till we reach the posterior longitudinal ligament. Copious amount of water and irrigation is given to avoid thermal injury to the, the neural tissues. Drilling is, is still continued and it is done always under microscope. And you can see drilling is still done. And I have almost reached the PLL now. And the, you can see the size of the hole. Rarely you, uh, you can insert a number eight or number six second nozzle. Drilling is complete now. I'm trying to remove the disc with a micro hook. Just sweeping the micro hook, you see the extruded disc comes out spontaneously. And you have to continue sweeping around to remove the remaining parts of the disc. You can see the disc fragments come spontaneously. You can use this ronger also, but a micro hook is more than enough for removing the extruded disc part. You can see the you can see the glimpses of the dura, uh, soft this part. You can use it micro ronger also. Two millimeter ronger. You have to look for any remaining disc. You can see them a large number of extruded fragments coming out, and I think this is the last fragment. You can, you see the millimeter upcut is difficult to insert. Almost, my job is almost done. I am sweeping for any hidden. Uh, you can use a curate to remove the swollen posterior longitudinal ligament and part of the annulus. I am the, doing the same thing to remove the 
part of the air. You can see the, even the axilla of the root is the beginning of the root is visible at the end of the surgery. And this is the happy face of the just on the next day patient is released and you can see the fa happy face of the patient. And motion, this is after, it is after several years, actually the motion is still preserved. You can see the motion preservation, motion is still preserved. There is movement in flexion external between C6 and 7 motion is preserved. And so there is no need of art artificial disc or anything. And this is post-operative CT showing the amount of bone drilling. So it starts as six or five, five to six millimeter hole and it does not hamper the stability of this spine. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry for the disappearing internet my i am where i am presenting internet today into our internet connection is very uh, problem doing very much problem thank you for a patient hearing thank you sir for a excellent case presentation there was a beautiful minimal access uh, discectomy that you have shown we are running short of time here and the case presented by uh, dr kairo nabi khan is actually also related to the next part of this uh, meeting so for here i would like to hand over the meeting to uh, dr pravesh chandra saha to take over this meeting and the questions then can, uh, on this case can also be asked with the next uh, case presenters as this is relevant to the second part too Thank you, everyone, for uh, being with us for this first half of the meeting. Thank you very much. Dr. Saha, can you take over, please? Dr. Pravash? Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Vishal. As we thank are you, running sir. a very short of time, uh, we directly move on to the second session. And thank you very much for your excellent moderation. Uh, first of all, Dr. Pravash, Dr. Pravash, we cannot. We cannot see you. Please uh, start your video. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Now, thank you, you. Thank you. Can you see me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, okay. I am not that much handsome, so that I am trying to hide myself. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So, uh, first of all, I would like to request um, uh, Dr. Professor Dr. Muhammad Anwar Islam to start his uh, lecture on uh, cervical myelopathy. Uh, Dr. Thank Anwar you, Simpson, uh, Dr. Prabhash. Uh, uh, can you see my slide share? Yes, sir. You can see, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. We can see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Respected but, chairperson, <coughs> dear but, moderator. But there, is, but there is error, some error. No slide. No slide is here. Yes, sir. Yeah, your yeah. slides are not moving, actually. Teletalk. Teletalk. I, I, I don't know, now it is moving. No, now it is moving. No, no. Kairon no, Novi, sir, please no. unshare your screen. Yeah. Kairon Novi, sir, please oh, okay, unshare. Sorry, sorry. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, Probably there is a problem. Yes. Kairon Novi, sir. Can you, can you see the uh, slide share, Provas? No, no, still not. No, no sir. Not. No. We are seeing Kairon Novi's slide. Yes. Dr. Kairon Novi, please oh. remove your un slide. Un un unshare your uh, uh, slide. Yeah. Dr. Kairon Novi. I have done. Oh, yeah. Okay. Anwar, yeah. Anwar, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. We can see, sir. sir. Professor Syed Shadul Islam, sir. Can you see? Yes, yes we can see. Yes, sir. Respected chairpersons yes, uh, and dear moderator, I am Professor Anwar Islam, uh, Professor of Spine Surgery, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujib Medical University, Bangladesh. Today, my topic is cervical myelopathy. Uh, cervical myelopathy usually is a common clinical condition which is caused by compression of the spinal cord that is characterized by clumsiness in the hand and gait imbalance. It occurs when there is clinically symptomatic dysfunction of the cervical spinal cord. The most common type of spinal cord dysfunction in patients older, older than 55 years. There is some history. Sir William Ricard Gowers first noticed the changes associated with the cervical spondylosis in 19, 1892. Dr. Victor Alexander Horsley performed the first laminectomy of six cervical vertebra 
October 1892. Stocky described cervical spondylosis and cord impingement in 1928. Lord Brain recognized myelopathy and radiculopathy as a clinical disorder in 1952. Epidemiology is a very little epidemiology, which is more common in men. And in men, 13% are in the third, third decade, but almost 100% of the men are affected over the age of 70. In case of female, 5% showing radiographic changes in the fourth decade, but which is 96% over the age of 70 years. There is some etiology that is the, uh, degenerative cervical spondylosis. Uh, there may be the congenital stenosis of the cervical canal. Uh, ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligaments, tumor, epidural abscess, trauma, and cervical kyphosis may cause uh, canal stenosis. Cervical spondylosis includes a number of spectrum, that is DDD, degenerative disc disease, which can be with or without degenerative facet joints, with or without the formation of the osteophytes, with or without the herniated disc, on or all of these changes contributes to an overall reduction in canal diameter. Spondylosis uh, causing cord compression, there is static mechanism, dynamic mechanism, which is impairing the compression within the spinal cord. In a static uh, compression of the spinal cord, uh, caused by usually osteophytes and hypertrophy of the ligamentous complex, disc materials, they are sometimes maybe the congenitally narrowed spinal canal. Dynamic mechanism easily related to the neck movements in a flexion, neck flexion. There may be reduction of AP diameter of the canal by two to three millimeter, uh, and which causes the uh, compression of the spinal cord. In a neck extension, there may be the ligamentous problem hypertrophy, which, which impinges the cord against the anterior osteophytes. And there may be the lateral movements, which causes nerve root compression, presenting with the reticular symptoms. Cervical canal dimension, usually from C3 to C7, in a Caucasian, normal diameter is 16 to 18 millimeter, but it is less in Asians. Cervical cord varies little in size. Sir, probably there is a network interruption, sir. Prabhash, can you hear? Yes, now, now I can, sir. Okay. Cervical cord varies little in size from C1, 2, and 7, and canal measuring ranges from 8.5 to 11.5 millimeter. Two third of the canal is unoccupied by the spinal cord from C1 to C3, but on fourth is only unoccupied at the level of C4 and C7. Vascular, imp vascular impairment within the cord. Osteophytes can compress anterior spinal artery, even compresses the venous of clinical presentation of myelopathy. There may be the gait disturbance or gait changes, bowel bladder involvement, uh, simultaneous lower extremity changes, that is sensory and motor, and diffuse hyperreflexia, that is upper motor neuron type ablations, and 20% even does not present any symptoms, any neck pain or even any arm pain. There is some science uh, in favor of diagnosis of myelopathy, that is Hoffman science, dynamic Hoffman science, L-Harvati science, inverted radial reflex, Cronus, finger escape sign, finger fatigue test, that is grip and release test, and as well as the jacks. This is the L-Harvati sign. You know all. In a neck flexion, there is electric shock-like sensation radiating down to the spine and the extremities. Hoffman's sign suddenly extends the DIP of the middle finger. It causes reflex flexion of the other finger, especially thumb and index. When it repeats of the other finger, especially thumb and index. When it repeats while the patient flexes and extends the neck, which facilitates the response dynamic Hoffman's sign. With the flexion and extension of the neck, when this maneuver is done, then it is the dynamic Hoffman's sign. Inverted radial reflex, you know all, that is when tapping the distal brachioradialis, usually there is a uh, extension of the wrist as well as the uh, radial deviation. But in here, when myelopathy is present, the wrist will be flexed and the 
uh, ulnar deviation will be all fingers. Grip and release test, that is dynamic hand sign, form the fist and extend the finger rapidly. Usually normal person can do 20 times in 10 seconds, but myelopathic persons cannot do. Finger escape sign, you just see the picture, uh, hold finger abduct, adducted and extend. Automatically the ring finger and little finger will be flexed and extended, uh, abducted. There are some scoring system that is Japanese myelopathic score. It depends on the motor involvement of the upper and lower extremity, sensory involvement of the upper and lower extremity, trunk involvement, sphincter involvement, and total score is 17. In a grade on myelopathy, the score will be 13 to 16. In a grade two myelopathy, score will be nine to 12. And grade three score will be five to eight. This is Neurix's disability scale. You know all, grade one to five, in a on, no difficulty in walking, but grade four, there will be, patient will be able to walk only with a system. But in a grade five, patient will be chair bound and bedded. Run our classification, uh, that is class one to class three, A and B. In a class one, class one, no pain and no neurologic deficit. Only patient with the pain, but in a grade uh, class three, A, there will be the objective weakness, long tax sign will be present, but patient still will be ambulatory. In case of class 3B, patient will be non-ambulatory. That is chair bound. Mainstream diagnostic tools, that is radiographs, myelogram, CT scan, CT myelogram, MRI, and electrodiagnostic tools. This is the X-ray, which shows the extent of cervical spondylitic senses and disc face narrowing, osteophytes, kyphosis, joint subluxation, and stenosis of the spinal canal that can be seen in plain X-ray of the cervical spine, FE and lateral. This is the MRI. MRI actually is the imaging of soils for the cervical spondylitic myelopathy or myelopathy. There is clear visualization of the cord impingement or compression can be delineated by the MRI. An indicator of irreversible cord damage can be seen in MRI, can be used to evaluate for non spondylitic causes of myelopathy, both in intrinsic and extrinsic to the cord. That can be diagnosed by MRI. This is the CT scan. Actually, it is helpful in assessing the canal stenosis. Show osteophytes better than radiography, good at defining the neural foramina, and useful in diagnosis, ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligaments. Normal AP diameter in CT is 17 millimeter, relative stenosis is 10 to 13 millimeter, and absolute stenosis is less than 10 millimeter. CT myelogram, it is better to detect the space of angulations. Management, you know, there is two uh, management, uh, mostly conservatively can be managed, but somehow needed the surgical intervention. Management conservative usually indication is mild disease with no functional impairment. Patients who are poor candidate for surgery. The mild disease can be uh, scored by the many scoring in a Japanese myelopathic grade one and two and neuric disability scale one and two and Ranaut class one and two that can be managed conservatively. Conservative means uh, observation, NSIDs, physical therapy, lifestyle modification. The indication of operative treatment, according to the clinical findings, where there is progressive neurological signs or symptoms, presence of myelopathy for more than six months, severe spinal cord compression, subaxial segment instability, and difficulty in walking, loss of balance, bile bladder incontinence. But according to the different scoring system, Japanese myelopathy grade three, Japanese myelopathy grade two, when conservative fails, and neuric disability scale grade three, and Ranawat class 3A and 3B are the candidates for operative treatment. Surgical approach, you know, many approaches, anterior posterior approaches in along the among the anterior approaches, there is sin, single or multiple anterior discectomy with fusion, anterior cervical corfectomy in a multiple level disease, start fusion techniques with or without the use of anterior instrumentation, posterior approaches, single or multi-level laminectomy, laminoplasty laminectomy and lateral mass fusion procedures. Selection of procedure depends on the cervical alignment, 
number of stenotic level, location of compression, medical condition. Anterior cervical discectomy and fusion, it has high success rate, more than 90% for all level. Disc removal or decompression and use of microscope, bone graft or case for fusion and usually with different fusion devices is available in uh, here and there. The discectomy with trichotical bone graft with plate and screw reinforcement, titanium case with bone graft with or without plate fixation, peak case with bone graft, peak case only, fixation and fusion by standalone peak case. Nowadays, titanium extend, expandable case. This is the, I would like to mention some uh, case illustrations uh, with indications. The preoperative extent MRI shows spinal cord compression at C4 and C5 with cervical spondylosis. You just see how much the extruded disc is here, who is compressing the cord. We do discectomy and fusion by trichotical bone graft with plate and screw reinforcement. Just see the power operative and post operative x rays. Another case uh, pre operative x ray and MRI shows spinal cord compression at C5, C6 level. We do discectomy and fusion by titanium cage with bone graft and plate fixation. This is the power operative and post operative x rays. This is another case, pre-operative X-ray and MRI shows spinal cord compression at C5, C6. You just see how much compression over there and patient presenting with the myelopathy. We do discate to end fusion by titanium case with bone graft without plate fixation. And after 12 months, you, you just see that how much fusion is over here at this level, 5, 6 level. This is another case, preoperative X-ray and MRI shows spinal cord compression at C5, C6. You just see how much compression is over here. We do discectomy and fusion by peak case with bone graft and fixation by locking plate and screw. This is the titanium, uh, peak case with bone graft and fused, uh, we do anterior plating, locking plating. This is another case, preoperative X-ray and MRI shows spinal cord compression at C5, C6, and C6, C7 with cervical spondylosis. You just see. And we do discectomy and fusion by peak case without bone graft. Another case, preoperative X-ray and MRI of spinal cord compression at C5, C6. You just see. And we do discectomy and fusion by peak case without bone graft, standalone peak case. And just 12 months after surgery, you just see how much fusion is over here without compressing the cordy key. ACDF with standalone peak case has some advantages. Shorter operating time than fusion by other ways. No need of bone graft, so no chance of donor site morbidity. No need for plate and screw fixation and removal of it, but it has only disadvantage that the device is expensive. Anterior cervical corvective and fusion. This is another modalities that is multi-level disease when disc and vertebra are removed, decompression of the neural elements, use of microscope, tichetical ideal iliac graft and titanium mesh case with bone graft for fusion, always with anterior plating. Use a C. That is OPLL. And this is compression of the cord and causing myelopathy at C5, C6, C6, C7 due to OPLL. We just do the cervical corfective and fusion by mesh case with bone graft and stabilization by plate and screw. We just see two level corfectomy. Sir, uh, you are slight uh, running short of time, so please manage. Okay. Posterior surgery, posterior cervical fissure instrumented depends upon the anatomy of the lordosis of the affected segment and surgeon preference. Posterior cervical fusion, decompressive laminectomy, laminoplasty may involve any an adjunct anterior fusion procedure to address the spondylosis. Indication for laminoplasty, OPLL over multiple levels, congenital canal stenosis, multi-level cervical spondylosis, posterior compression from ligamentous hypertrophy, 
as a part of state statute and posture canal expanding procedure. Is that C, preoperative extra of the spinal cord compression at C5, C6, C6, C7, and C7, T1. We go for the cervical laminoplasty of C6 and C7. Laminectomy and lateral mass fusion indications are OPLL over multiple levels, congenital canal stenosis, <laughs> multi-level cervical spondylosis with subluxation, posterior compression from ligamentous hypertrophy. This is the preoperative X-ray and MRI causing spinal cord compression at C3, 4, C4, 5 with subluxation of C3, 4 and C4, 5. You just see how much subluxated. So it can we do mute, laminate please. to be? So it mute, please. We do laminate to be lateral mass fusion. You just see. In a conclusion, cervical myelopathy is one of the most common spinal pathology. Most of the patient needs surgery, surgery where indicated. Risk benefits ratio is to be assessed in patients with early stage. Main objectives of surgery are adequate decompression and maintenance of stability. Type of surgery depends upon location, extent of pathology, and a spinal alignment and dimension of the cervical spine. Thank you everybody for patient sharing. This is my university where I'm working as a professor of spine surgery. Okay, thank you everybody. Thank you, sir, for your very excellent presentation. Uh, today we have uh, four eminent uh, spine faculties as the panelists in this session. I would like to introduce Professor Dr. Syed Shahidul Islam, uh, Dr. Abhoy Nene from India, and Dr. Mihir Bapat from India, and Dr. Muhammad Yusuf Ali from Bangladesh. Now, I would like to request uh, Dr. Arvind Kulkarni to present his topic on cervical radiculopathy. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, sir, we can. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this uh, opportunity. So this is a very familiar situation. A patient walks in, uh, it's a, in a similar patient. He's a 48-year-old gentleman. Uh, he's a software professional, right-handed. He has significant uh, right arm pain of two weeks duration from the neck to the thumb with associated paresthesia. Pain is getting better now, uh, gradually. So he has a few questions. So what this condition could be? What is the line of treatment? Should I get an MRI done? What are the odds of getting better with non-operative treatment? How long it will take to get better? What if no? What if non-operative treatment fails? And if it needs surgery, what kind of surgery and the success rate? And will surgery surgery guarantee that I will never experience a similar episode again? So let's go through this uh, process of understanding this particular uh, situation. So cervical radi radiculopathy basically means radiating symptoms in the upper limb, shoulders, upper back, and the neck. It could be pain, paresthesia, and there could be a weakness in one of the muscles supplied by these nerve roots. And this is basically because of dysfunction of the nerve root. And most often it is unilateral and follows a particular discipline that is a dermatomal or a myotomal pattern and may be associated with axial neck pain. This is as a result of the supply of sinovertebral nerve to the posterior annulus, PLL, or even uh, periosteum. And this radiculopathy may be associated with myelopathy, which one should be uh, aware, of, aware of. So the classical uh, examination here is the spurling test. So with regards to examination, so when we examine patient with dorsal spine issues or lumbar spine issues, uh, you know, we generally put them on the bed. A best uh, examination situation for a cervical patient would be to make him sit in the center of your consulting room on a stool so that you can walk around him. So uh, this is a very popular test. Uh, it's it's a basically the spurling test wherein you extend the neck and tilt the neck on the side of the symptom and patient, uh, you know, uh, replicates that kind of uh, pain painful situation and it's highly sensitive and highly specific. In fact, this particular examination can be done without actually touching the patient. You just ask the patient to turn his head on the side of the, uh, on the, side of the uh, pain and uh, you know the patient gets pain. In fact, when in the history itself will tell you that when I lie down on that particular side in the bed, it hurts and I turn to the opposite side. 
so this is a very classical uh, uh, test next comes uh, you know this davidson shoulders abduction test again this patient you know you can make a diagnosis in a uh, uh, in a uh, flash when the patient enters your clinic because the patient many a times carries his you know forearm on his head that itself you know clicks a diagnosis so this patient generally uh, uh, these these patients generally get better with abduction of their arm because that relaxes the nerve root and uh, this is one way of uh, picking up this particular uh, uh, diagnosis so this uh, chart is basically to show that you know when you examine examine these patients so neurological examination is a must so when you examine these patients there is no muscle to be tested when there is involvement of c2 c c1 to c4 nerves and all the dermatones related to this particular these particular roots lie on the back of the neck and the upper back so when it comes to examination of the muscle groups the c5 is usually tested using uh, on uh, you know uh, uh, by examining the deltoid and biceps biceps could also be supplied by c6 so specific would be uh, deltoid for c5 specific for c6 would be a wrist extension uh, specific for uh, c7 would be triceps that is uh, elbow extension wrist flexion and finger extensors c8 with uh, you know for finger flexors and t1 for interosseous and the dermal uh, dermatomal distribution is you know if you go clockwise it from upper uh, uh, upper arm uh, upper radial to upper ulnar it is c5 c6 c7 down then as shown here in the diagram and then c8 t1 t2 up and uh, these are the reflexes for these particular roots biceps for c5 brachioradialis for c6 and triceps for c7 it is very interesting to note that this kind of typical presentation is actually very atypical in 46% of uh, pay, you know uh, subjects a normal population uh, do not follow this particular pattern and there could be overlap of these dermatomes this is because you know when these dermatomes and uh, were studied there was a lot of flawed mapping and you know these was like the lenke classification where a limited x rays were done to classify the scoliosis only 2 to 5 subjects were uh, 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 you know investigated and if one should remember that again in spite of all that there are intradural interconnections between these nerve roots which can uh, give rise to this atypical presentation again it's very important when it comes to cervical radiculopathy because any pain in the upper limb can mimic cervical radiculopathy but in clinical practice one uh, usually no, uh, you know sh should be able to differentiate it from uh, you know shoulder uh, complaints because this is one of the commonest differential diagnosis so most commonly when you abduct the patient you know uh, the patient if the patient has pain in the shoulder it's most probably coming from the shoulder and again it's very important when the patient has a c5 palsy uh, to rule it out from so suppose patient has a c4 to 5 disc herniation which is not very uh, 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 significant and the patient also has weakness in the uh, complaints of weakness in the shoulder you know if the if the patient is able to uh, you know move the uh, is not able to move the upper limb that is active is not possible and uh, you can passively do it it's most probably because of uh, root pathology again this is a flow chart which uh, uh, ki kind of guides in management of these particular patients uh, so it is uh, quite busy uh, quite, quite a busy flow chart basically what it means is if the patient has a shorter history and if the patient's symptoms are minimal with no neurological deficit treat them conservatively for at least about 6 weeks and you know this again depends on the surgeon and the patient's appetite as to how long they wait and if the patient in the you know doesn't get better in these 6 weeks or there is increased uh, there is increased uh, neurological weakness which is very unusual or if the patient has pain neurological weakness which is extending more than 6 weeks then you investigate the patient and if you find a positive pathology then you treat uh, you know then there are options of further conservative treatment in terms of nerve root blocks etc again you should have an appetite to send a patient for a root block or you continue treating the patient with Uh, uh with conservative uh, treatment till your uh patients run out runs out either from the surgeon side or the patient side and then you go ahead with surgery 
on the other end if the patient has neurological deficit or you know significant pain which is lasting beyond 6 weeks and there is a negative pathology on investigation then you had you know refer the patient to a neurologist or you handle it yourself by doing a emg nerve conduction studies this is a usual pattern that uh, is suggested so coming to uh, this particular condition is very important for us to understand the natural history of this particular disease because we are not going to take this patient straight to the ot the very day he comes with this kind of pain first of all it is not a very common situation it's you know the the incidence is one in 1000 population and it peaks in this particular age group 50 to 55 where the incidence in this age group would be about 2 out of 1000 what these studies uh, shown here show that demonstrate is that you know close to 60 to 70% of the patients either improve or continue with mild tolerable symptoms and a very small percentage of patients need surgery none of them become myelopathic in fact this last study is an icing on the cake which shows that 24 out of 26 patients were treated conservatively uh, in within one year uh, uh, one year's time so it has a very favorable natural history this is one particular condition which can you know portray uh, or be an excellent excellent example to uh, uh, you know to showcase this hippocrates oath that is do no harm in fact right from the Uh, you know even without examining the patient you know by asking the patient to do spurlings on his own by uh, appreciating his uh, uh, you know abduction test uh, one can treat him even without actually touching this patient conservatively with medication physiotherapy etc so rarely is surgery required and you see the market will sting you with you know these devices you will have this company guys coming every day showing you new devices with pin without pin with screws without screws you sometimes uh, wonder you know is, uh, is there such a big market for this particular device so don't be overwhelmed by these device factories because these patients 90 majority of them get better uh, with uh, conservative treatment again the duration of conservative treatment varies from uh, uh, doctor to doctor what one should see rather than for rather than duration of treatment what one should see for is the trend that is what i look for so if the patient see whether the patient's pain is getting better or getting worse if the patient get, pain is getting worse then most probably this is a someone who will probably end up with surgery also rule out myelopathy on your examination so rest and medication orthosis physiotherapy uh, and in some situation injections are the mainstay of conservative treatment again there is no evidence to prove that medication physiotherapy non surgical treatment can alter the natural history of cervical radiculopathy but in general since with time they get better we treat them with physio medication uh, collar etc again uh, very rarely do we need electro diagnostic studies when the mri has already picked up and there is a good match in the radiology and the uh, clinical uh, matter so uh, this uh, electro diagnostic study is important when there is a mismatch so it is critical in identifying non root level lesions because the exon which shoots off from there is from the drj not from the uh, spinal cord itself so again the one of the other uh, uh, applications of uh, uh, electro diagnostic study is to uh, clarify whether the weakness is because of pain or whether it is because of Uh, whether it is there is actually clear now uh, you can localize a particular root with a great sensitivity and specificity but now conduction study as it measures the you know distal runoff from the dorsal root ganglion it helps in excluding peripheral neuropathies entrapment syndromes like if, uh, you know like a carpal tunnel syndrome etc brachial Bla plexus uh, plexopathies this f wave h wave are used in rare situations and ssp again use helpful when there is an issue with myelopathy drugs nsaids opioids we can't uh, there's no much evidence but it's instinctive of any surgeon any physician to start uh, these kind of medication there is some evidence that steroids help again uh, it is tempered with the fact that again the pain might collapse after the, the steroids are stopped again neuroleptics uh, they give some degree of pain relief and there is some bonus of behavioral implications you know they they start feeling better they get good sleep etc so that is the reason there is a backing up of uh, these particular drugs uh, 
So, physiotherapy, there are very interesting papers with regards to physiotherapy claiming one, uh, you know, uh, option over the other. Uh, so, this is an interesting study from European Spine Journal where the surgery was uh, uh, compared with physiotherapy versus color and physiotherapy included. Dr. Mehdi, Dr. Mehdi, please, please mute yourself. Dr. Mehdi, please. Dr. Mehdi, Mehdi Face B, please mute yourself. Thank you. So, what it showed was physiotherapy was better than collar and surgical groups. Again, there's another interesting study where it showed that, you know, physiotherapy and collar did better than a non-intervention group. But these studies were good in the sense that these were comparative studies and they were uh, randomized. And what physiotherapy uh, is better, it, there is some consensus that traction plus exercise is better than exercises alone. And this was a RCT which was double-blinded. So again, uh, when I had never read about collars in cervical radiculopathy, it was all by uh, you know training. So, but it was a deja vu because uh, this is the same pattern which is uh, what that we follow is actually there in uh, black and white. So the um, uh, issue of collar is controversial. Uh, it is only a temporary measure for pain relief. Uh, it controls spasm and original pain. Uh, you shouldn't be using it long term. It is all there in literature. And again, reverse collar that we usually advise uh, is also there in literature. So what the reverse collar basically means is you put the tall part in the back and the short part of the collar in the front. And you know, basically do the reverse of curling. You open the foramina up by flexing the neck. So that is how uh, it unloads the foramen and uh, relieves the pain. Again, uh, steroid injections are highly controversial. There is uh, there is good amount of efficacy with these uh, injections, but you know uh, uh, you need to have an appetite to advise this kind of this particular uh, uh, option to your patients because you can have catastrophic uh, complications like blindness, quadriplegia, death. It has all been mentioned in literature. So you need to really sit down and counsel. Uh, uh, to undergo this particular uh, 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 you know, uh, treatment. So, uh, when do we operate? So, now everything has failed. Patient still continues to have pain. So, a patient is running out of uh, patience. So, that is the most common. That is a relative indication that is pain and discomfort. Patient wants to get back to his routine. Absolute is when you have neurological weakness. That is usually seen you know, when you have a deltoid weakness, when you have frank wrist weakness when you have frank triceps weakness, etc., or myeloradiculopathy. So, the, uh, what are the options that we have? From the anterior corridor, we have ACDF, we have disc replacement, we have uh, just discectomy alone. And from behind, we have posterior laminoforamentomy. So, ACDF is the staple diet for uh, anterior uh, disc herniations. So, uh, this can be done by anyone, anytime, anywhere. But mind you, you should, uh, it should be very important to stress the point that this is a very gadget and infrastructure intensive surgery. You need to have uh, radio, uh, uh, you know, you need to have a good CM, you need to have a good operating table which can support the patient's head. Uh, uh, you need to have a uh, microscope, you need to have uh, sharp instruments, you need to have uh, sharp curates, thin plates, thin kerosene plates. Uh, so, unless you have all that, it can be a nightmare. And every surgeon should, should know this. Every spine surgeon should know this particular procedure uh, because it delivers excellent results. And it's, this is the gold standard treatment for uh, cervical radiculopathy. Uh, it, should, it should also be understood that it could be a soft disc or a disc osteophyte complex, in which case a burr is very, very necessary on table. So, it has a high degree of success. And the approach is quite direct. It is avascular, follows the facial planes. Uh, and, you know, you can, uh, uh, it has a wide access right from the center to the periphery. And there is no, uh, most importantly, there is no neural uh, retraction. And it, uh, it jacks up the disc space, just like a T-leaf cage and stabilizes the segment. It's very important here to note that the nerve root that you're treating here is the exiting route. Okay, so you need to open up the foramen. That is very, very important. 
and again this particular uh, 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 surgery is associated with minimal post operative pain we have all experienced that and with minimal rate of complications but coming to the darker side of this particular surgery you are spoiled for, for choice the choices are absolutely chaotic uh, this uh, the allograft auto, autograft uh, uh, standalone cage standalone cage with pins standalone cage with uh, screws plates various kinds of plates etc so which is the best so you know there is on it is ironical that one on one hand which is a gold standard it has the highest success rate of, of, of all, most of the uh, uh, spine surgery among all the spine surgery but there is still hunt for the object of desire that is a substance of desire that you are going to place it there so there could be a standalone case this was one this uh, the, uh, article on top was uh, one of the first papers uh, which we published uh, which has close to about 50 citations which shows that you know standalone cage uh, is enough it maintains uh, 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 lordosis it mean uh, the incidence of subsidence is minimal on the other hand there is another art recent article where they compared cage alone with a uh, 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 graft with plate and a cage with uh, uh, plate and it has shown that the autograph is the best with the plate so highest level uh, incidence of fusion and highest percentage of uh, lowest percentage of subsidence so again if you go so we have all uh, become a bit uh, lazy because we are depending upon these standalone cages uh, at any level one level two levels multi three or four levels but uh, you know there is recent uh, evidence that these have a high subsidence rate and a high non union rate so uh, let's go one by one so autograft stand alone it has so most of the the positive side of all these the disclaimer on for all these is they have a high rate of fusion but still what are the weaknesses stand alone autograft high incidence of resorption kyphosis graft fracture pseudarthrosis graft site morbidity stand alone case kyphosis subsidence pseudarthrosis dislocation because of a plate you high incidence of asd dysphagia implant related complications so the study of desire would be an autograft versus allograft versus stand alone cage without screws versus stand alone uh, with screws versus plate with graft versus, versus plate with allograft versus plate with metal cage versus plate with p cage versus acd alone so probably bss and bss can do an extensive study we have so many surgeons so probably we can do a multi centric study including all these subjects of uh, st uh, objects of desire again there's another interesting and uh, good option that is a posterior option so this is a motion preserving uh, surgery so if you have a soft disc you uh, uh, remove the disc the most uh, 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 the best indication is a foraminal stenosis we just need to unroof the foramen uh, it is avascular but when you try to do a discectomy it can be quite bloody so a spurling test and a hard disc and a foraminal narrowing is the best indication for uh, this particular procedure it's minimally invasive it's a road less traveled it's as a, it's an option is selected that is posterolateral uh, herniations posterolateral compression outside the canal it's a motion preserving device without an implant it is less expensive and it avoids the complications of anterior approach and carries all the benefits of mis surgery again arthroplasty came as a promise because it was supposed to mimic nature because we are not supposed to fuse we are supposed to move uh, so it came with also promise of delaying asd which was one of the issues with uh, you know acdf uh, there are very limited and strict criteria as to when you do this this is for soft disc herniations tall discs young patient without deformity <clears throat> with no facet arthritis so the very small uh, bracket of patients wherein you can do this so there are complications uh, uh, which could be quite uh, uh, discouraging heterotopic ossification subsidence dislodgement neurological complications uh, discouraging because this is an expensive device with a lot of promise and you know we have we'll end up in this uh, kind of complications you end up with a sorry figure Uh, as it compares to acdf technically it's a image guided surgery the patient's neck has to be positioned in neutral uh, to avoid kyphosis or lordosis uh, you know positioning of the cage the soft tissue dissection has to be minimal any cautery work can uh, incite bone formation so we should use bipolar as much as possible and avoid cautery midline discipline has to be maintained with 
checkpoints at, uh, at various anatomical sites. This has several steps, so one has to be patient uh, when you compare it with the ACD of surgery. It's very important to you know respect bony end plane to prevent subsidence. So the trick here is to use the shortest height and the widest footprint to prevent uh, heterotopic calcification and subsidence. So that's why we did a study to see to uh, uh, capture the right footprint uh, for our population, subcontinental population, uh, for uh, for this with regards to this device. And again, unlike a cage, this has to be inserted without distraction. Now, but how does it compare when it comes to outcomes? So these are the questions one would ask. ASD motion outcomes. So the quality of published studies is weak. Heterotopic ossification, unfortunately, it's a rule rather than an expansion. Only thing we can be happy about is that it is not inferior to an ACDF. It does allow short-term preservation of cervical mobility, probably postpones fusion by a few years. Its efficacy in preventing ASD or a favorable cost uh, effectiveness ratio has yet to be established. Again, it's very interesting uh, to note that the ACD, without doing a, a, a fusion itself, uh, delivers the goods and there are multiple publications uh, to uh, which, uh, uh, which celebrate this particular surgery. Uh, again, in comparison with, there is a study where they've compared it with a fusion device and they've shown that these patients do as well without the complications of the fusion device. Uh, I would suggest you to go, go through these particular uh, articles, especially the one where uh, Sontag and uh, uh, Peter Clara have uh, debated uh, in uh, spine as to whether ACD uh, has to be uh, combined with the F, that is uh, fusion. So to summarize, uh, the natural history of this particular condition is extremely favorable. Conservative treatment is the mainstay. Only in resistant cases do we operate. ACDF is still gold standard. There are alternate options uh, with the plus point of motion, motion preservation, that is both posterior foraminotomy and uh, disc replacement, but the indications are very limited. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your very excellent and elaborate presentation. Uh, we are already running short of time, near about uh, 30 minutes. So uh, I would like to request now Dr. Mohammad Shoydul Islam Akon to uh, present his uh, case presentation. Dr. Akon, please share your screen, please. Yes, yes. Thanks, uh, everybody. To this session here. Uh, my topic is uh, cervical degeneration. Me, Shahidul Islam Akon from Dhaka Medical College Hospital. And I have some cases here. Already we discussed very long in cervical radiculopathy and myelopathy. So I go through this case in short. Case uh, number one in 38 years old lady, housewife, neck and right arm pain for 15 days severe. She has also pain previously, but 15 days serious pain. Tingling and numbness in the thumb and index finger, anterior cyst and scapular pain also, shoulder abduction side positive. Sensory deficits in the lateral forearm, thumb and index finger. Motor weakness, elbow flexion weak and biceps regular diminished. Restricted cervical spine movement and no upper motor sign. This is looks like this cervical C6 radiculopathy. So we thought some diagnosis here we discussed previously very well. In cervical disc herniation is the first diagnosis, then spondylosis, uh, degeneration, and heart disc, also peripheral in treatment, neuropathy, and so on. And uh, investigation previously discussed here, lab some lab dissection, X-ray, AP, lateral, oblique, and dynamic, lateral X-ray flexion extension, CT, MRI, myelogram, and electrodiagnostic, EMG, and nerve conduction velocities. And this is X-ray of the cervical spine, this lady, there is a slight kyphosis on the cervical spine and disc space narrow in the five, six space with some slight osteophyte here. And in MRI, there is a bulging of the disc at the C5, 6 level, compressing the right-sided C6 nerve roots here. So many more treatment options, conservative and operative in conservative immobilization, bracing, eyes. There are many more medication and non operative also physiotherapy and other modalities like TENS, short-wave diathermy, 
manipulation. Manipulation is sometimes dangerous, and also injection, epidural steroid, and nerve blocks. And operative treatment indication: failure of non-operative management, progressive neurological deficit, aesthetic neurological deficit associated with significant radicular pain, and confirmed imaging technique, and also with the with myelopathy. Surgical treatment: anterior apus and posterior anterior anterior cervical discectomy. Only discectomy and fusion. Many poor option: bone graft, bone graft with plating, case, stalagmite case, and arthroplasty, and anterior foramenotomy. In it posterior, posterior foramenotomy, open method, minimally invasive by tubular destructor, and also endoscopy. We perform this ACDF uh, using the bone graft, autogenous bone graft from the iliac crest. Me always like the iliac crest bone graft and also plating here. Case two, same type of case. 50 years female housewife, right side radiculopathy on C7, uh, fissure of C7 uh, radiculopathy in the right side. X-ray osteophyte present in the C5, 6, and 6, 7 also. Disc space reduced in the 5, 6. Bulk in MRI, T1, T2. Looks like disc prolapse at the level of the 6, 7, compressing the right sided C. Seven roots, and here we use this type of stalagmite cases: anterior cervical discectomy and fusion ACD have done post-op and also three months. Case three: 63 years male person He is a farmer, neck pain, clumsiness of both hands, difficulty with grasping and holding object, sense of stiffness of the both legs, occasional fall recently, exaggerated deep tendon reflexes. That means upper motor sign. Present here looks like a myelopathy case. Modified neuritic grade is three and modified zoa score is twelve. And this there are some digits also. Mainly, most likely cervical spondylitis, myelopathy, and other cervical cord compression due to tumor, tuberculosis, another disease. Also medical condition also. And investigation as like mentioned previous X-ray, MRI, T1 weighted images, T2, and There is huge disc prolapse at the level of the C six seven compressing the cord, not on side the root here. So compressing the cord and thinning the cord. So this case fissures look like a myelopathy and compress the cord. You see very greatly thinning the cord here. Treatment in myelopathy conservative and operative. Conservative role is uh, less. Just observation of neurology deterioration and counseling the patient. Regarding neurologic natural history and explain option for decompression. Goal of surgery, like other uh, spine surgery, decompression, stabilization, and also re-establishment of the normal sagittal alignment. Approach uh, anterior and posterior. Doctor Shahid. Yes, yes, Dr. Shahid. Uh, yes. May I interrupt you here? Yes. So, uh, sir, I would like to draw the attention of Doctor Kulkarni, sir. So after seeing uh, this case scenario, especially the third case, so what is your plan to uh, proceed with th uh, this clinical scenario with a huge disc prolapse involving more than one level? Yeah, since I was uh, uh, my mind was on my you know fellow's phone call, so I had to I probably I can uh, move the question to Dr. Nene and Dr. Bapat if you don't mind. I was on one of my patients yet. Give me a call, my fellow. So I was answering. Okay, oh, okay, sir. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Probably, doctor. So, in this, yes. Again, Kulkarni, sir. Uh, this is a case of this. This case looks like a soft disc here, huge disc, but patient present with not radiculopathy, present with myelopathy here. Yeah. So, yeah. So, doctor Shohit, may I yeah. may I seek the opinion of doctor uh, Abhoy Nene, sir, here? Sir, sir, Nene, sir, are you? Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, yeah. It's a large day scan. If there's neurology, because just early myelopathy in a of a short duration with a large soft disc with no motor component, uh, I'm still okay to conserve. And I've conserved such. I admit them and give them uh, methylprednisolone and watch them through. But if there is a motor component and um, you know there's significant disability and it's a little more chronic, I would uh, get a CT scan here and then plan an anterior surgery for this patient. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sir. Nene, so one more question to Nene sir. So I would, uh, I would like to draw your attention to that many of our younger surgeons are enjoying this uh, uh, seminar. Uh, you see, the in the first presentation of Professor Dr. Anwar Islam, 
uh, regarding uh, diagnosing myelopathy, he has mentioned about different scoring systems like GOA, neuric grading, adenoid classification. For uh, what is your suggestion? Uh, avoiding this clumsy uh, classification maneuvers or the complex uh, assessment uh, policies, how our younger surgeons can simply decide whether they would go for surgery or where they would proceed with conservative management in such uh, scenarios? How would they proceed? Uh, it's a very good what question, uh, Pravash, because uh, uh, each patient comes with a different set of expectations. So you have to look at their own disability status. For example, I have needed to operate uh, a shooter, an Olympic shooter, merely because he had tingling at the tip of his finger when he was in that position, which you and I mean, we, of course, as surgeons, we, we uh, you know, would fall in that category. But a lot of people for tingling at the tip of the finger would not seek surgery. On the other hand, there are a number of uh, fairly disabled people because of uh, a old stroke or some, you know, other lesion who have a long-standing uh, spondylotic myelopathy, but they're not disabled because of it. So even though their radiological compression is significant, if their relative disability is not high and they're not demanding a surgery, because you know in myelopathy, the natural history study suggests that only 30% of them actually worsen in their lifetime. So I'm quite conservative in those and uh, I would not fall in line with a classification. I'd rather choose horses for courses and give that patient the benefit to decide whether his relative disability is good enough to ask for surgery. Okay, thank you, sir. That means we should go for the patient needs-based surgery, sir. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Dr. Shwet, please proceed. Yes, so uh, treatment uh, indication for non surgical only mild cases in spondylar cervical stenosis without myelopathy, close observation, I already discussed here. And in surgical approach, anterior, uh, anterior cervical discectomy and fusion, anterior cervical corpectomy and fusion and posterior laminectomy, laminectomy with fusion, laminoplasty, and combined approach that means sargam, principal fusion, both anterior and posterior, anterior first or posterior first, it is debate here. And uh, this case, this is subtype of uh, DIG, so we do here the uh, anterior cervical discectomy and fusion. And uh, last case, my uh, 40 years is a school teacher. Weakness of all four limbs recently changed his handwriting. He's a teacher, so handwriting is important for him. Gait disturbance and tendon reflexes exaggerated. Bevinsky sign positive pronus present, modified neuric grade three and modified zoa score is 13 here. And this is X ray. This is MRI. First, some um, our colleague uh, performed this type of, uh, he understands it is a lumbar problem. So, MRI performed in the lumbar, but in the screening field, we show this there is compression in the uh, C5, 6, 6, 7, and behind the body of C6. So again, do this uh, cervical spine MRI and share T1 images and uh, myelofilm. This is uh, T2 images, both sagittal and axial. Uh, looks like uh, used compression at the 5, 6, 6, 7, and behind the uh, C6 compression here. So we do here this uh, CT scan. And you see here, the CT scan, mostly compression here at the level of uh, behind the C6 body, it looks like this OPLL, but OPLL here only the uh, behind the C7. So we do plan for surgery anteriorly and uh, anterior cervical corpectomy and fusion, subsetal corpectomy with uh, iliac crest bone graft and uh, stabilized by the anterior cervical plate and screws. This is a uh, follow-up x-ray and end of my uh, talk here. So we can uh, continue the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shahid. Um, our next yes. uh, present, present. Uh, is there any question I am asking from the audience, please? For Dr. Shahid Akon. So thank you very much, Dr. Shahid Akon, for your excellent presentation. Now I would like to request Dr. Kiji Chaudhuri uh, for present uh, his uh, case presentation. Thank, thank you, Dr. Pravash, uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. So quickly, I'll go through the case uh, and 
This is a 77-year-old gentleman, uh, known uh, coronary artery disease, had uh, a coronary bypass surgery several years ago, has good cardiac function. He's a retired doctor, right-hand dominant, has pain radiating in the right upper extremity, more or less in the C6 distribution, has weakness in the right shoulder, which uh, he says that he finds it difficult uh, since his, he is right-hand dominant to do overhead activities. He has some neck pain, but the neck pain is not his predominant problem. It's the arm pain that is his predominant problem. And this story has been going on for six months and the problem, according to him, has been progressively increasing and he's disturbed by it. And his examination is, uh, is like this. Uh, his gait is normal. He can do a tandem walk. So his balance is quite good. He, uh, his Romberg's test is negative. His neck range of motion is okay. I didn't do a spurling on him because I got to see his MRI before this. Uh, but uh, his neck range does not give rise to pain in his arm. Like extending the neck does not elicit an arm pain. Uh, his sensations are intact though. Uh, he has right deltoid and biceps of four out of five, but there is no atrophy. He has good head function. His handwriting is quite good. So his function, fine function is quite good. Uh, right side biceps and triceps is not elicitable, but otherwise his reflexes are fine. Bilateral ankle reflexes are not elicitable. He had a spine surgery in the lumbar spine again about a decade back. Uh, so maybe that's related to that. But he does have a Hoffman um, sign on both sides. No, sorry, Babinski on both sides, but he doesn't have a Hoffman. And this is his X-ray, uh, degenerative cervical spine, more or less straight alignment. You can see that the canal is developmentally narrow. I'm not sure if that is OPLL, but you know, it's, uh, it's for a 77 year old as expected. Uh, and this is his cervical spine MRI, uh, shows multiple level of stenosis. You can see the cord signal change at these three levels. You can appreciate that. And these are his detailed actual images. Obviously, craniovertebral area is fine. Uh, I thought the upper cervical areas were also okay, except for the central stenosis he has starting from C4-5. Uh, but here you can see at C5, C6 level, if you can see my cursor, uh, he has a right-sided foraminal stenosis here, which is more spondylo spondylotic, more like an osteophytic narrowing along uh, uh, compression here in the foramen, as well as obviously he has compression of the spinal cord. Uh, but that that's what one I identified this one, which is a cut probably just above C5, C6. And this is C6, 7, which shows the maximum central stenosis as well as bilateral foraminal stenosis. And here you can appreciate uh, how narrow the right sided foramen is. Uh, he does have a left sided foraminal stenosis also at C6, 7. And obviously at uh, the lower level, uh, C7, T1, he, he's pretty okay. And just for you to kind of look at these, I know this is too fast for you to see, maybe this one is better. Uh, so what next means to summarize, his problem is arm pain, which has been progressively increasing. He has some low motor neuron signs, which show that he has a weakness in deltoid and biceps. Uh, he's disabled by it. He has a very soft subclinical sign of uh, uh, long track signs like the only Babinski. But otherwise, he, would, he wouldn't score very low on JOA at all. His JOA probably is like 18. So, so what would you do now? And now this, this chap uh, Dr. Uh, Chaudhary, has tried everything. May, yeah. may, may I interrupt you? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I now I'd like to uh, draw the attention of Dr. Mihir. Uh, with this kind of clinical scenario, uh, do you think uh, there is a, any necessity of doing CT scan for further evaluation with a uh, very clumsy spine and mild kyphosis? Yeah, so allow me to answer the previous question. I think uh, uh, you had asked, how do we grade myelopathy? So yeah. how, what do you call what do you call as mild myelopathy? What do you call as moderate? And what do you call as severe? Now, uh, if you understand the JOA classifications, there are scorings which say which is mild, which is moderate and which is severe. But like Abhay pointed out, this mild, moderate, severe has to be really evaluated according to the needs of the patient. Now, in this particular case, as uh, Shitish has said, 
the problem the patient is presenting to you with is only arm pain now in a 70 year old with a chronic history like this of a multi level degenerative spondylotic myelopathy uh, first to answer your question ct scan yes i would get a ct scan done for multiple reasons one to find out whether there is subtle ossifications uh, at the level of the disc or behind the disc uh secondly if i am planning a posterior approach it al also allows me to study the lateral masses on the ct scan which i may be uh, intending to fix if i want to do a laminectomy and to give him a little bit of lordosis okay so these uh, also to study the foraminal stenosis very very accurately on a ct scan so if i want to do a foraminotomy i would plan my foraminotomy on a ct scan so ct scan is absolutely mandatory now one has to understand that this patient has a right sided foraminal stenosis you have to evaluate his shoulder very very critically don't try to examine this patient only as a spine the spine may give rise to periarthritis of the shoulder the periarthritis of the shoulder may present as a spine pain may present as an arm pain now if this patient it has pointed out that there is no wasting that doesn't mean that the patient does not have a frozen shoulder or a tendinitis in the shoulder so just attributing that you know that foraminal stenosis will get rid of all his problems is very difficult to judge and therefore offering him a conservative treatment with a prolonged physiotherapy with attention to his shoulder trying out epidural and root blocks would come prior to taking any decision of surgery in this patient so so in this situation what is your mind regarding the babinski sign how do you want to deal see babinski sign if shitij is really convinced about it most of us would end up writing babinski equivocal you understand this patient has had a lumbar spine surgery already and uh, right shitij he has had a lumbar spine surgery yeah he's he's had a lumbar spine fusion he so he had, had a lumbar, lumbar spine about fusion. 10 years back uh his yeah. ankle jerk may be absent and he yeah, it is absent he doesn't have any long track sign except for that babinski exactly and so this to, kind of a chronic compression of the spinal cord so, but it's so not symptomatic for spinal cord so he has no long track signs apart from a babinski which has to be really evaluated with a lot of caution because it is the only sign which you which you are sort of attributing to the cervical spondylotic myelopathy which which may be a little over exaggeration of uh, our our kind of assessment now uh, if you see the spinal cord here uh, the spinal cord does appear to be compressed and uh, there are subtle myelomalacic changes inside the spinal cord okay so looking at the radiology and looking at babinski it gives you an impression that this patient could be heading for a disaster but believe me these presentations could have been there on his mri for the last 10 years and the patient has maintained his function extremely well so at one point in time taking a decision on this mri without clear cut evidence of myelopathy resulting in disability is is not probably the correct thing to do any so other do opinions? you agree uh, with that point sir that you we should more focus more? on the um uh, prabhash may i uh, add something um um this case especially the uh, mri sequences we have been seeing both the t2 images as the sagittal and as well as the axial i do prefer to have the t1 as well to t1 sagittal and t2 sagittal the multiple level signal changes in the sagittal t t2 images better to see t1 also because the what is going on on the mri the signal changes in t1 so in the multiple level signal changes <clears throat> the maybe the neurologically not so serious at this moment but in this situation if you if you see the the myelo the neurological deterioration goes outside it would be 
the 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 operation will be more complicated in future so i my suggestion better to do a ct and we, uh, we need to see the t1 images and just is multiple level of uh, signal changes myelopathy i do prefer to think about surgery in this situation to prevent further deterioration of his neurological dr prabhas can i add yes. can i add something dr prabhas yes 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 of yes, course sir mehir mehir please yes yes and listen to me yeah in that uh, particularly in that situation where there is a multi level anterior compression of the cord and there is already myelomalacic change in several uh, segment of the cord so as the patient had the history of uh, lumbar surgery 10 years back in that situation probably the other myelopathic fissure is submerged or unmask with this situation in that situation i want i would like to do the dynamic extra of the cervical spine if there is instability over there and i do i i, I want to do the ct scan of the cervical spine if there is a ossification of long segment or even focal ossification of the opll pll with this uh, two consideration if there is any need for the posterior decompression even in the uh, uh, instability we can do the posterior decompression by laminectomy and lateral mass fusion otherwise in the anterior uh, anterior surgery will not be sufficient for the patient as it is a multi level how many level you, do, you would like to do corpectomy two or more if it is two or more then there will be the restriction of the movements of the neck in particular in that situation posterior surgery will be better no i i think i think uh, uh, you know the consensus is very clear if it is one or two levels we go anterior if it is more yes. than two levels it is posterior so that that consensus is very clear this case brings about a very important concept which is what is called as early myelopathy or pre preclinical myelopathy now in this patient there is a radiological significant stenosis there is only babinski sign but his motor and sensory power is well preserved and he doesn't have any ataxia so on the joa scoring system he will still score as 16 by 17 you understand what i'm saying that means that he has almost no myelopathy on the joa score but but if you want to demonstrate this further there are investigations like ssp there are investigations like diff diffuse tensor imaging in this patient if you do a dti study then this dti study will be abnormal it will tell you about early spinal cord dysfunction however the literature is unclear whether dti should be the evidence on which you should base a surgery because if you do surgeries on the basis of a dti then almost 99% of the patients with a narrow canal will go in for a surgery even though they are mild or no symptoms so let let me But, go uh, ahead with the hot 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 city shows city shows yeah. that the knee jerk is 2 ah 2 plus yeah. or 2 even and ankle jerk is absent with a positive babinski sign with a history of yeah. lumbar surgery 10 years back yeah me so i think i think uh, i should uh, give chance to so, dr chaudhary to proceed so let let me let me speak yeah. now so what happened so so the the so so going back to the problem this patient has this patient has presented primarily primarily with pain it's a radicular pain and he objectively has weakness in the deltoid and biceps okay he specifically you can demonstrate it as well as he can say that this this chap is a although he has got a bypass surgery he used to play regularly tennis he is a right handed dominant and he cannot play tennis and his pain has been increasing and you know because he has been, he is a doctor he has done everything he has done that physiotherapy and all those things and whatever even non recommended treatment also he has taken the problem is that his pain is increasing and he has such an mri picture now because of this uh, conflicting clinical sign and obviously dr mihir is what he said is absolutely right you cannot really jump to surgery because the mri looks terrible 
and it's a very important to rule out so he, his shoulder examination is completely normal he doesn't have any problems with range of motion and the shoulder test so he doesn't have a local problem in the shoulder and we also got a neurologist involved asked the neurologist to examine this patient and try to see how these uh, uh, clinical features correlate with the mri and the neurologist went and did emg ncv as well as ssct as they normally do most of the time when you refer a patient to them this patient has an ssct that is delayed in the cervical spine it is delayed and he has a right sided uh, electrophysiologically uh, proven radiculopathy which means that his paraspinal muscles show denervation potentials and that's why the neurologist was kind of saying that okay he has radiculopathy and he has a subclinical uh, slowing down of ssct that he they can localize it to the cervical spine i mean uh, we i mean obviously we did not get dti because i don't know how to interpret dti as dr bapat said that you know if if the dti comes positive then what you know we don't know how to uh, act on it you might say um not that we are kind of uh, uh sure extremely sure right now but the point i want to highlight it highlight is it's it's good to take a, an opinion from a neurologist or your colleague or something where you are not very sure of whether because you know here you are you are deciding on surgery which can be ranging from a small surgery like a foraminotomy to a big laminectomy with a fusion in a 77 year old uh um, so you know things were going towards surgery for this patient um, and and the neurologist uh, did um, concur with our assessment with the electrophysiology study we did not get a ct scan done but probably i should have got uh, maybe it would have changed uh, the way i did surgery but i kind of went by the mri that okay there is foraminal stenosis i am going to do what i am going to do the ct is not ct scan is not going to change the way i'm going to do surgery so i did not do a ct scan and i did a laminectomy i did a fusion and i did foraminotomies on the right side at two levels the left side i did not do foraminotomies now post op this patient was fine his radic the pain went away instantly i mean it went away so instantly that i thought that god if i would have just done the deroofing of that foramen this patient would have been fine um and uh, although i had explained to him c5 palsy uh, before surgery uh, as luck would have it uh, the doctor on the third or fourth day said that his left deltoid is now weak okay so on the fourth day his left deltoid became grade 2 his right side pain is gone his and he he kind of uh, on the morning round he told me doctor you told me that i might get a c5 palsy look i've got it you know so i kind of said okay i did a face palm and i said okay we'll give you some steroids and i hope that you recover so and and uh, just to cut the story short uh, this was his at two months he was doing some range of motion uh, at this i don't know if it's playing but these are videos and then at 18 months he recovered i mean obviously steadily as uh, we were following him he was showing reco recovery so we did not jump the gun and do post op imaging and revise revise his surgery or anything like that we just waited it out and as most c5 palsies they do recover but retrospectively i kind of I, i'm not sure if anybody would have done a different kind of surgery for him but uh, you know Uh, that's how this was anybody would have done a different surgery no or maybe a prophylactic foraminotomy on the left side i mean i did not do any prophylactic foraminotomies on the left side no uh, i don't no, no. know whether it would have made any difference no no the no. thing is uh, to be frank um uh, did his emg show any uh, uh, radiculopathy on the left side not not on the left side it showed on the right side the right side so, but right uh, left was completely uh, normal left side was right. fine left side was fine so left probably, side was fine probably you didn't have a warning but if you had a ct scan and probably yeah but yeah probably yeah the ct scan if it would have i mean here c6 c7 is stenotic <coughs> c5 c6 is okay yeah. i mean not so bad c5 c6 dr mehir yeah 
it is probably that can be the post operative hematoma compressing the c5 on the left side in that situation there is a Yes, yeah, I I really don't be. know. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, a post-operative hematomas. Uh, I mean, Tension. we really don't know why C five palsies do happen, but we do know laminectomies and fusions carry one of the highest risks. Or of, during uh, laminectomy, there uh, may be the yeah. there may be the uh, uh, um, uh, just uh, mild trauma over the C five root on the left side during uh, foraminectomy. Uh, I did not do left sided foraminectomy. Oh, you do only right-sided for a minute. No, again, right, again. I mean, he had only right-sided pain. I did right-sided for a minute. I did not do left side. It is. Uh, uh, yeah. When you do a see, when you have a very short a short disc in lumbar spine, and when you do a Smith Peterson, <laughs> and you instrument in lordosis, it closes the foramen, and you might get a palsy. Correct. So similarly, yeah. here, if you maintained it in lordosis, maybe you know the foramen yeah. must have compromised in size yeah. in dimensions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, what Dr. Kulkarni is saying is absolutely right, and and I learned this uh, after this case and discussing it with Dr. Abumi and all when they had come last year, uh, when this case just had happened, and uh, what he told me that whenever he does a surgery for a realignment procedure, like a posterior realignment procedure for a straight spine or a mobile. Uh, cervical kyphosis. If you are realigning it and fixing it in lordosis, then he does a uh, he does a routine foraminotomy, and not not the kind of foraminotomy that we are used to. He does a foraminotomy that goes all the way out to the uh, complete lateral border of the lateral mass. Means it's not like fifty percent of the lateral mass, but he traces out the root completely. Uh, and then I mean, because I remember in this patient, I changed the position of the head of this patient. So I, I did a laminectomy. I had already put in the screws, and before inserting the rod, I held the Mayfield, and I and I kind of tried to lift it up to fix it in in a be best possible lordotic position. If you are ever doing this kind of a maneuver uh, for a posterior instrumented fusion, uh, mm -hmm. according to Dr. Abubi's experience, and he has published this also, uh, he says that the risk of uh, post-op C5 palsy is just too high. So. he always always uh, does a prophylactic uh, foraminotomy for those kind of patients but on, not a routine foraminotomy for the usual laminectomy fusions that you do which are not realignment procedures i think uh, that's it in who i mean i have one more question would anybody would have would have thought of just doing a deroofing posterior foraminotomy for this patient i mean no. the, uh, keeping aside the uh, keeping aside the fact that this is a doctor who understands what spinal cord compression is and you know uh, it's difficult to have this conversation with him not to touch the spinal cord probably but, with uh, with neuro monitoring on i would probably do that but it's still risky you know positioning you know what dynamics happens yeah you don't know so probably with neuro monitoring protection just do it and yeah and, and and this patient had neuro monitoring throughout the surgery and obviously this uh, c5 palsy happened on the fourth day so there were no neuro monitoring alerts uh, during the surgery the ssp was delayed uh, to the same extent as it was pre operatively so there were there were no kind of sort of alerts that we were worried about but uh, the the one thing that helped me the most was counseling this patient pre operatively I mean, I told this patient at least ten times that look, boss, it's possible that you might get a C5 palsy after the surgery because of the the way this this surgery is. Uh, although most C5 palsies recover, some may not. That's the risk that you will have to take. And he kind of accepted that risk. And he, and before the uh, before my resident could examine this patient, this patient volunteered. and said in the morning rounds that look doctor you told me that this might happen and i have got it i will do physiotherapy and i'll be fine and he was like pretty happy about it kind of a thing that uh, and he did work hard for it and he did recover so so good. thank you I, dr choudhury i have one question yeah you yeah. keep talking yeah. about c5 palsy but you are not shown any c4 5 yeah yeah you are not shown any? the c5 i wanted to come to that point c4 5 yeah here 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 yeah yeah 
so we had uh, two patients with c5 palsy and what we found from literature was many a times it could be c5 six causing c5 palsy the overlap of these myotomes yeah. so if you read literature so this is the yeah you wanted to see the foramen right at c5 six c4 five that's the picture at c4 five no i think i think Shiti, you rightly Sorry. said uh uh i think Shiti, i mean once it has happened uh, you know now basically once bitten twice shy you know if i have to do a realignment i am not i am now going to do a for i'm prophylactic for i'm going to be now for so these my, levels my other least, question yeah. is that is there evidence see the c5 palsies are because of a posterior shift of the cord they are not because of foramenal stenosis now is there any evidence that Correct. doing prophylactic uh, like is there a large series a randomized blinded yeah. study which is showing foramen to be done versus or even even a case control study or even historic controls yeah. which show that the incidence yeah. of c5 palsy is less if you do prophylactic foramen otomy yeah so that's what or i was saying the, that's the abomin is, is it intuitive or is it uh, no. evidence based and the other issue yeah, so is that c5 yeah. palsy is always recover correct so uh, the so, first question is that there is a, a series published by abumi's group from hokkaido where they did these realignment procedures for straight cervical spines and flexible kyphosis and did an intraoperative maneuvering to correct them in those patients they found 25% chance of getting a c5 palsy when they did not do foramenotomies and because of that experience they started doing uh, prophylactic foramenotomies and their incidence dropped i mean it is not completely zero but it is not as high as that much and he has found it only in situations where he does a realignment procedure so not for the routine laminectomies where you kind of just do a laminectomy and leave the patient alone or or you are fixing them inside to they are lordotic to begin with and you are not doing anything to the like a you are not doing a deformity correction but for the deformity corrections uh, he uh, i mean obviously i don't have that much experience but his experience is for deformity corrections he does a prophylactic foramenotomy and the second question uh, that they always recover probably always is too strong a word but most of them do recover uh, i do know of two Shitich. patients uh, uh, that have not recovered shitish yeah Shitich. can you just uh, stop yeah. sharing i'll just share uh, this oh. uh, all of you go through this article good article on c5 palsy it's a meta analysis uh, which answers most of the queries raised by samir it's uh, can you stop sharing I, i did share i did stop i have stopped uh can you see me yes so uh, if you see the risk factors uh, for an and diameter and preoperative cord rotation were identified as risk factors for c5 palsy pool prevalence was about 6% 84 risk factors were studied and uh, uh, they have sort of narrowed down how to sort of uh, judge which patients are high risk so this is a good paper in the factors associated with c5 palsy following cervical spine surgery a systematic review so uh, uh, we had a case where we did a foramenotomy and even after that the patient landed up with a c5 palsy after fixation so uh, this is what we were analyzing after that obviously we should have done it before that but we were analyzing it after that so <laughs> the the, so it, the problem is that your foramenotomy itself can injure the uh, nerve root no but exactly that, that is my exact thing i yeah. i feel very so, after doing a laminectomy i just feel as adding on to the surgery by trying to do further foramenotomies no in the yeah. i have never done i have never done it uh, <clears> i have <throat> had only one c5 palsy in my life foramenotomy dr mehir mohit Huh. Doctor Meir, in yes. all case, you want to do uh, prophylactic foramenotomy? Not exactly. That Or is, is there any is there any parameter that how much uh, kyphotic deformity when you correct uh, by the uh, uh, posterior instrumentation uh, 
uh, in that situation, uh, you, you want to do prophylactic uh, from an atomic from C5 policy. Oh, if it is a severe kyphosis, I would really judge the role of anterior and posterior surgeries. I don't do pedicle screws like Abubi does. So the yes. amount, of, amount of corrective forces which a lateral mass can offer are very, very limited. And uh, uh, usually uh, those forces are not very severe. And that is why when you look at a CT scan, you have to be very sure that there is no severe stenosis at the C4, 5 or C5, 6. That is all you look at on the CT scan where you might be tempted to do a foramenotomy. And like Shitish said, while doing a foramenotomy, you have to be extremely careful. So uh, luckily now, you know, we have been very friendly in using ultrasonic uh, saws now. And those are really very, very helpful in doing foramenotomies. You can really cut through and get a very, very good decompression with those saws. So those really help. But really, can you prevent a palsy? I have no answer. That means you, it can still happen. Dr. Pravash. Hello, do you have any time limit, please? Dr. Prabhash. Dr. Prabhash? Yes, yeah, sir. So now we, to, we to come to an end. Dr. Prabhash is probably out of. So, so I I the, I I sir. the case was interesting, so people forgot about the time. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, it's so a that, very interesting. The discussion case. was so lively that we, were, we forgot about yeah. the time limit, sir. Yeah, so yeah. that Pravash was sleeping. Uh, <laughs> we also <laughs> forgot to invite our uh, chairperson for this session, Dr. Goregaonkar. <laughs> Goregaonkar is the head of uh, orthopedics at Cyan Hospital. Big orthopedic unit. So, so, so we can uh, take uh, the final uh, comments and summary from Dr. Goregaonkar and we yeah. end, end here. Sir, I'd like to request Dr. Goregaonkar, sir, please. Uh, please put you some comments, sir. Yeah. So, uh, very good discussion. Uh, what I want to uh, just uh, add in is that C5 palsy does occur if the cord is in the uh, cervical spine in the extension. So, that is where the cord is taken away posteriorly and there is a traction palsy and that almost always recovers. It takes about nine months to one year to recover slowly, but you have to be assured, give assurance to the patient that it is most likely going to recover. Otherwise, uh, the discussion was excellent, actually. There are a lot of things, points which are discussed well. And uh, Shiti had done a good presentation and good reasoning why he did that kind of surgery. But uh, probably in that this, this patient, I wouldn't have done fixation. That's the only thing. Only the, only the decompression would have been a better option. Thank you. Thank so you, sir. My, uh, my, my thing of doing fixation just as of uh, the answer was because I was going to do foramenotomies and he had a straight cervical spine and I was going to remove quite a bit of facet. I added the fixation. But you are right. Adding implants in elderly people can give rise to more problems. Yeah. So, but the, the the reason why I did it was because I was going to do a foramen anatomy as well in a straight spine. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you, thank you, Dr. Chaudhary. Uh, we are very uh, near to the end of this session, and and before going to the end, I would like to request our very senior faculty of our country, Professor Dr. Sir Shahidul Islam, uh, to put some comments uh, regarding this session. Thank you. There is no comments. Only to say uh, my, thank you everybody for the excellent show very beautiful presentations uh, uh, by the speakers as well as the presenters and a lovely discussion between you and us uh, dr anur Islam presented uh, uh, myelopathy but uh, uh, there is a, a lovely paper published by asian journal in 2017 and the review article that this says a dynamic mri has uh, some role for diagnosis of myelopathy, especially in extension view, we can see more uh, compressions. But in case of disherniation in flexion view, we can see some com uh, compression, but it, there may be some exaggeration uh, also. So uh, I have seen many SCDF presented by uh, Dr. Ranaur and uh, Kulkarni, and uh, uh, there are many 
uh, junior boys and girls and to one common adjacent segment degenerations. This is a symptomatic degenerations. There is a lovely papers by uh, Hilly Brandt and they said that symptomatic degeneration after 10 years is 25%. And to prevent this symptomatic degeneration is if we have a plate fixations, we should have a at least five millimeter distance from the adjacent uh, disc level. This is my two comments. And uh, uh, regarding the uh, probably honor miss that there is a progression of CSM is 75 hertz step uh, wise progressions and 25 had the slow progression and 5% uh, rapid progressions. But I, I, I want to say something about the conservative treatments. So we can treat the patient conservatively in case of myelopathic patients. Uh, but there is a neurological deterioration uh, between 20 to 60 percent of the patient with DSM will uh, deteriorate neurologically within three to six months. So there is a uh, scope for conservative treatment, and uh, we should consider conservative treatments in case of mild to moderate uh, myelopathy. That is why modified Japanese orthopedic score is uh, uh, 13 or more in older case and short duration of symptoms. And what is the large transverse diameter of the spinal cord and a higher public uh, index or public ratio and the non circumferential compressions? And in case of soft disc herniations, we can consider conservative treatments. But we share, we have to own the patients, we have to uh, say about the progression of the disease. There may be some deteriorations, and a he or she may need subsequent surgical interventions. Thank you, everybody. There is a lovely discussion again. Thanks uh, for the uh, for participation also. Thank yeah. you, sir, for your very valuable comments. So before going to the closing, I would like to request uh, one of our another chairperson of this session, our president, honorable president of Bangladesh Spine Society, Professor Dr. Khandukar Abdullah Rizvi, sir, to put some comments regarding the session. Okay, thank you, everybody. Actually, uh, I, have, uh, I have been... Uh, benefited from the lot of uh, discussion. And in fact, uh, there were so many elaborate discussions and in-depth discussions, there's so many questions in our mind have been answered, but still there are questions which cannot be answered so easily because there are so many controversial issues that will remain and we will we'll also continue to discuss all these issues. Uh, anyway, uh, I would like to especially thank the speakers Everybody has spoken so nicely. Uh, I'm quite, really impressed uh, uh, the way the speakers uh, presented. Uh, lovely presentation, I must say. And uh, also the contributors who have uh, given their comments, lovely comments. Uh, thank you. With these viewers, thanking everybody and thanking Sudhir Sivastava. Uh, and uh, uh, what I can say, this is a corona period. We cannot invite a youth to come to Dhaka. Okay. Uh, in November, we have our meetings to Bangladesh Fine Society. If situation improves, I would like you all people to be in Dhaka to help us uh, in, uh, in the spine surgery. Thank you. And uh, with these few words, uh, I would say good night to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank, thank you, sir. With the thank permission you, of, of uh, the presidents of the Bodha Society, uh, may I conclude the session with the hope that very soon, after getting rid of this pandemic situation, we both the societies will meet uh, physically on a very glorious occasion. And thank you very much for thank a very you. magnificent deliveries and discussion. And hope to see you again once again. Thank you very much. Thank and you. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Thank Thanks you so much. much. Thank good night. you. Good night. So may I? Yeah, I, uh, it okay. was a good uh, meeting of East and West. Uh, you know, though we are, uh, uh, we have a boundary between us. We are all united uh, in terms of culture, food, uh, the language, rivers, sea, a lot of things we share. So it was, uh, Destiny was, uh, was, you know, wanted us to meet uh, on Zoom today. So yeah, probably yeah. before uh, meeting physically, we can have a session on lumbar spine sometime later, whenever yeah, you... Yes, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Yes, Kulkarni. Kulkarni. 
Yes. Okay. In next uh, session will be on lumbar spine disease, uh, and uh, I think in the next November, uh, the COVID situation will be over from the world. I hope. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and along with my president, Professor Kondokar Abdul Rizmi sir, and we will invite you uh, all of you to be uh, here in Dhaka in our next spine meeting. Uh, before that, uh, I'd like to give thanks to Dr. Kulkarni, Dr. Vishal, Dr. Mihir, and the uh, senior people, Dr. Sadda, and other uh, those who are joining with us from the Indian side, as well as our Professor Kondokar Abdullah Rizvi sir, Professor Soyed Shodul Islam sir, among our senior and junior faculties from Bangladesh Science oh. Society. And we hope that both of these societies will going to run this course uh, tomorrow and uh, in a near future, near future or far future evening, we will be repeatedly meet uh, each other uh, from the eastern side of this globe to the western and western southern side of this globe. Okay, thank you everybody for uh, also joining also with TV, us. Also, TV for uh, streaming this live. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, 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 Arabin. Thank, thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Good night. Bye bye. Good night again. Thank you, sir. Sir, may sir, I good night, sir. Meeting, sir. Stay safe. Sir, sir, I'm yeah. shocked to him.